Section 15 of The Descent of Man, Part 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Sizemore The Descent of Man, Part 1 by Charles Darwin Chapter 6 On the Affinities and Genealogy of Man Part 1 Position of Man in the Animal Series The Natural System Genealogical Adaptive Characters of Slight Value Various Small Points of Resemblance Between Man and the Quadrumina Rank of man in the natural system. Birthplace and antiquity of man. Absence of fossil connecting links. Lower stages in the genealogy of man as inferred firstly from his affinities and secondly from his structure. Early androgynous condition of the vertebrata. Conclusion. Even if it be granted that the difference between man and his nearest allies is as great in corporeal structure as some naturalists maintain, and although we must grant that the difference between them is immense in mental power, yet the facts given in the earlier chapters appear to declare in the plainest manner that man is descended from some lower form, notwithstanding that connecting links have not hitherto been discovered. Man is liable to numerous slight and diversified variations which are induced by the same general causes, are governed and transmitted in accordance with the same general laws as in the lower animals. Man has multiplied so rapidly that he has necessarily been exposed to struggle for existence and consequently to natural selection. He has given rise to many races, some of which differ so much from each other that they have often been ranked by naturalists as distinct species. His body is constructed on the same homological plan as that of other mammals. He passes through the same phases of embryological development. He retains many rudimentary and useless structures which no doubt were once serviceable. Characters occasionally make their reappearance in him which we have reason to believe were possessed by his early progenitors. If the origin of man had been wholly different from that of all other animals, these various appearances would be mere empty deceptions. But such an admission is incredible. These appearances, on the other hand, are intelligible, at least to a large extent, if man is the co-descendant with other mammals of some unknown and lower form. Some naturalists, from being deeply impressed with the mental and spiritual powers of man, have divided the whole organic world into three kingdoms, the human, the animal, and the vegetable, thus giving to man a separate kingdom. Spiritual powers cannot be compared or classed by the naturalist, but he may endeavor to show, as I have done, that the mental faculties of man and the lower animals do not differ in kind, although immensely in degree. A difference in degree, however great, does not justify us in placing man in a distinct kingdom, as will perhaps be best illustrated by comparing the mental powers of two insects, namely a caucus or scale insect and an ant, which undoubtedly belong to the same class. The difference is here greater than, though of somewhat different kind, from that between man and the highest mammal. The female caucus, whilst young, attaches itself by its proboscis to a plant, sucks the sap, but never moves again, is fertilized and lays eggs, and this is its whole history. On the other hand, to describe the habits and mental powers of worker ants would require, as Pierre Hubert has shown, a large volume. I may, however, briefly specify a few points. Ants certainly communicate information to each other and several unite for the same work or for games of play. 
They recognize their fellow ants after months of absence and feel sympathy for each other. They build great edifices, keep them clean, close the doors in the evening, and post sentries. They make roads as well as tunnels under rivers and temporary bridges over them by clinging together. They collect food for the community, and when an object too large for entrance is brought to the nest, they enlarge the door and afterwards build it up again. They store up seeds, of which they prevent the germination, and which, if damp, are brought up to the surface to dry. They keep aphids and other insects as milk cows. They go out to battle in regular bands, and freely sacrifice their lives for the common wheel. They emigrate according to a preconcerted plan. They capture slaves. They move eggs of their aphids as well as their own eggs and cocoons into warm parts of the nest in order that they may be quickly hatched, and endless similar facts could be given. On the whole, the difference in mental power between an ant and a coccus is immense, yet no one has ever dreamed of placing these insects in distinct classes, much less in distinct kingdoms. No doubt the difference is bridged over by other insects, and this is not the case with man and the higher apes. But we have every reason to believe that the breaks in the series are simply the results of many forms having become extinct. Professor Owen, relying chiefly on the structure of the brain, has divided the mammalian series into four subclasses. One of these he devotes to man. In another he places both the marsupials and the monotremata, so that he makes man as distinct from all other mammals as are these two latter groups conjoined. This view has not been accepted, as far as I am aware, by any naturalist capable of forming an independent judgment, and therefore need not here be further considered. We can understand why a classification founded on any single character or organ, even an organ so wonderfully complex and important as the brain, or on the high development of the mental faculties, is almost sure to prove unsatisfactory. This principle has indeed been tried with hymenopterous insects, but when thus classed by their habits or instincts, the arrangement proved thoroughly artificial. Classifications may, of course, be based on any character whatever, as on size, color, or the element inhabited. But naturalists have long felt profound conviction that there is a natural system. This system, it is now generally admitted, must be, as far as possible, genealogical in arrangement. That is, the co-descendants of the same form must be kept together in one group apart from the co-descendants of any other form. But if the parent forms are related, so will be their descendants, and the two groups together will form a larger group. The amount of difference between the several groups, that is, the amount of modification which each has undergone, is expressed by such terms as genera, families, orders, and classes. As we have no record of the lines of descent, the pedigree can be discovered only by observing the degrees of resemblance between the beings which are to be classed. For this object, numerous points of resemblance are of much more importance than the amount of similarity or dissimilarity in a few points. If two languages were found to resemble each other in a multitude of words and points of construction, they would be universally recognized as having sprung from a common source notwithstanding that they differed greatly in some few words or points of construction. But with organic beings, the points of resemblance must not consist of adaptations to similar habits of life. Two animals may, for instance, have had their whole frames modified for living in the water, and yet they will not be brought any nearer to each other in the natural system. Hence, we can see how it is that resemblances in several unimportant structures in useless and rudimentary organs, or not now functionally active or in an embryological condition, are by far the most serviceable for classification, for they can hardly be due to adaptations within a late period, and thus they reveal the old lines of descent, or true affinity. 
We can further see why a great amount of modification in some one character ought not to lead us to separate widely any two organisms. A part which already differs much from the same part in other allied forms has already, according to the theory of evolution, varied much. Consequently, it would, as long as the organism remained exposed to the same exciting conditions, be liable to further variations of the same kind, and these, if beneficial, would be preserved, and thus be continually augmented. In many cases, the continued development of a part, for instance, the beak of a bird or of the teeth of a mammal, would not aid the species in gaining its food or for any other object. But with man we can see no definite limit to the continued development of the brain and mental faculties as far as advantage is concerned. Therefore, in determining the position of man in the natural or genealogical system, the extreme development of his brain ought not to outweigh a multitude of resemblances in other less important or quite unimportant points. The greater number of naturalists who have taken into consideration the whole structure of man, including his mental faculties, have followed Blumenbach and Cuvier, and have placed man in a separate order under the title of Bimana, and therefore on an equality with the orders of Quadrumina, Carnivora, etc. Recently, many of our best naturalists have recurred to the view first propounded by Linnaeus, so remarkable for his sagacity, and have placed man in the same order with the quadrumina under the title of primates. The justice of this conclusion will be admitted, for in the first place we must bear in mind the comparative insignificance for classification of the great development of the brain in man, and that the strongly marked differences between the skulls of man and the quadrumina, lately insisted upon by Bischof, Abbey, and others, apparently follow from their differently developed brains. In the second place, we must remember that nearly all the other and more important differences between man and the quadrumina are manifestly adaptive in their nature, and relate chiefly to the erect position of man, such as structure of his hand, foot, and pelvis, the curvature of his spine, and the position of his head. The family of seals offers a good illustration of the small importance of adaptive characters for classification. These animals differ from all other carnivora in the form of their bodies and in the structure of their limbs, far more than does man from the higher apes. Yet in most systems, from that of Cuvier to the most recent one by Mr. Flower, seals are ranked as a mere family in the order of the carnivora. If man had not been his own classifier, he would never have thought of founding a separate order for his own reception. It would be beyond my limits, and quite beyond my knowledge, even to name the innumerable points of structure in which man agrees with the other primates. Our great anatomist and philosopher, Professor Huxley, has fully discussed this subject, and concludes that man in all parts of his organization differs less from the higher apes than these do from the lower members of the same group. Consequently, there, quote, is no justification for placing man in a distinct order, end quote. In an early part of this work, I brought forward various facts showing how closely man agrees in constitution with the higher mammals and this agreement must depend on our close similarity in minute structure and chemical composition. I gave as instances our liability to the same diseases and to the attacks of allied parasites, our tastes in common for the same stimulants and the similar effects produced by them, as well as by various drugs and other such facts. As small, unimportant points of resemblance between man and the quadrumina are not commonly noticed in systematic works, and as, when numerous, they clearly reveal our relationship, I will specify a few such points. The relative position of our features is manifestly the same, and the various emotions are displayed by nearly similar movements of the muscles and skin, chiefly above the eyebrows and round the mouth. 
some few expressions are indeed almost the same, as in the weeping of certain kinds of monkeys, and in the laughing noise made by others, during which the corners of the mouth are drawn backwards, and the lower eyelids wrinkled. The external ears are curiously alike. In man the nose is much more prominent than in most monkeys, but we may trace the commencement of an aquiline curvature in the nose of the Hulak gibbon, and this in the Semnopithecus nasica is carried to a ridiculous extreme. The faces of many monkeys are ornamented with beards, whiskers, or mustaches. The hair on the head grows to a great length in some species of Semnopithecus, and in the bonnet monkey it radiates from a point on the crown with a parting down the middle. It is commonly said that the forehead gives to man his noble and intellectual appearance, but the thick hair on the head of the bonnet monkey terminates downward abruptly and is succeeded by hair so short and fine that at a little distance the forehead, with the exception of the eyebrows, appears quite naked. It has been erroneously asserted that eyebrows are not present in any monkey. In the species just named, the degree of nakedness of the forehead differs in different individuals, and Eskridge states that in our children the limit between the hairy scalp and the naked forehead is sometimes not well defined, so that here we seem to have a trifling case of reversion to a progenitor, in whom the forehead had not as yet become quite naked. It is well known that the hair on our arms tends to converge from above and below to a point at the elbow. This curious arrangement, so unlike that in most of the lower mammals, is common to the gorilla, chimpanzee, or orang, some species of hylobates, and even some few American monkeys. But in hylobates agilis, the hair on the forearm is directed downwards or towards the wrist in the ordinary manner and in H. lar it is nearly erect, with only a very slight forward inclination, so that in this latter species it is in a transitional state. It can hardly be doubted that with most mammals the thickness of the hair on the back and its direction is adapted to throw off the rain. Even the transverse hairs on the forelegs of a dog may serve for this end when he is coiled up asleep. Mr. Wallace, who has carefully studied the habits of the orang, remarks that the convergence of the hair towards the elbow on the arms of the orang may be explained as serving to throw off the rain, for this animal during rainy weather sits with its arms bent and with the hands clasped around a branch or over its head. According to Livingstone, the gorilla also, quote, sits in pelting rain with his hands over his head. End quote. If the above explanation is correct, as seems probable, the direction of the hair on our own arms offers a curious record of our former state, for no one supposes that it is now of any use in throwing off the rain, nor in our present erect condition is it properly directed for this purpose. It would, however, be rash to trust too much to the principle of adaptation in regard to the direction of the hair in man or his early progenitors, for it is impossible to study the figures given by Eskrich of the arrangement of the hair on the human fetus, this being the same as in the adult, and not agree with this excellent observer that other and more complex causes have intervened. The points of convergence seem to stand in some relation to those points in the embryo which are last closed in during development. There appears also to exist some relation between the arrangement of the hair on the limbs and the course of the medullary arteries. It must not be supposed that the resemblances between man and certain apes in the above and in many other points such as in having a naked forehead, long tresses on the head, etc., are all necessarily the result of unbroken inheritance from a common progenitor, or of subsequent reversion. Many of these resemblances are more probably due to the analogous variation which follows, as I have elsewhere attempted to show, from co-descended organisms having a similar constitution and having been acted on by like causes 
inducing similar modifications. With respect to the similar direction of the hair on the forearms of man and certain monkeys, as this character is common to most all the anthropomorphous apes, it may probably be attributed to inheritance. But this is not certain, as some very distinct American monkeys are thus characterized. Although, as we have now seen, man has no just right to form a separate order for his own reception, he may perhaps claim a distinct suborder or family. Professor Huxley, in his last work, divides the primates into three suborders, namely the Anthropidae with man alone, the Simiidae, including monkeys of all kinds, and the Lemuridae with the diversified genera of lemurs. As far as differences in certain important points of structure are concerned, man may no doubt rightly claim the rank of a suborder, and this rank is too low if we look chiefly to his mental faculties. Nevertheless, from a genealogical point of view, it appears that this rank is too high, and that man ought to form merely a family, or possibly even only a subfamily. If we imagine three lines of descent, proceeding from a common stock, it is quite conceivable that two of them might, after the lapse of ages, be so slightly changed as still to remain as species of the same genus, whilst the third line might become so greatly modified as to deserve to rank as a distinct subfamily, family, or even order. But in this case it is almost certain that the third line would still retain, through inheritance, numerous small points of resemblance with the other two. Here then would occur the difficulty, at present insoluble, how much weight we ought to assign in our classifications to strongly marked differences in some few points, that is, to the amount of modification undergone, and how much to close resemblance in numerous unimportant points as indicating the lines of descent or genealogy. To attach much weight to the few but strong differences is the most obvious and perhaps the safest course, though it appears more correct to pay great attention to the many small resemblances as giving a truly natural classification. In forming a judgment on this head with reference to man, we must glance at the classification of Simiidae. This family is divided by almost all naturalists into the Catherine group, or Old World monkeys, all of which are characterized, as their name expresses, by the peculiar structure of their nostrils, and by having four premolars in each jaw, and into the Platherine group, or New World monkeys, including two very distinct subgroups, all of which are characterized by differently constructed nostrils and by having six premolars in each jaw. Some other small differences might be mentioned. Now man, unquestionably, belongs in his dentition, in the structure of his nostrils, and some other respects to the Catherine or Old World division. Nor does he resemble the Platherines more closely than the Catherines in any characters, excepting in a few of not much importance, and apparently of an adaptive nature. It is therefore against all probability that some new world species should have formerly varied and produced a man-like creature with all the distinctive characters proper to the old world division, losing at the same time all its own distinctive characters. There can, consequently, hardly be a doubt that man is an offshoot from the old world simian stem, and that under a genealogical point of view he must be classed with the Catherine division. This is nearly the same classification as that provisionally adopted by Mr. St. George Mivart, who, after separating the Lemuridae, divides the remainder of the primates into Hominidae, the Simiidae, which answer to the Catherines, the Sebidae, and the Hapalidae, these two latter groups answering to the Platherines. Mr. Mivart still abides by the same view. The anthropomorphous apes, namely the gorilla, chimpanzee, orang, and hylobates, are by most naturalists separated from the other Old World monkeys as a distinct subgroup. I am aware that Grace Chalet, relying on the structure of the brain 
does not admit the existence of this subgroup, and no doubt it is a broken one. Thus the orang, as Mr. St. G. Mavart remarks, quote, is one of the most peculiar and aberrant forms to be found in the order, end quote. The remaining non-anthropomorphous old-world monkeys are again divided by some naturalists into two or three smaller subgroups. The genus Simnopithecus, with its peculiar sacculated stomach, being the type of one subgroup. But it appears from M. Gaudry's wonderful discoveries in Attica that during the Miocene period a form existed there which connected Simnopithecus and Macacus, and this probably illustrates the manner in which the other and higher groups were once blended together. If the anthropomorphous apes be admitted to form a natural subgroup, then, as man agrees with them, not only in all those characters which he possesses in common with the whole Catherine group, but in other peculiar characters, such as the absence of a tail and of callosities, and in general appearance, we may infer that some ancient member of the anthropomorphous subgroup gave birth to man. It is not probable that through the law of analogous variation a member of one of the other lower subgroups should have given rise to a man-like creature resembling the higher anthropomorphous apes in so many respects. No doubt man, in comparison with most of his allies, has undergone an extraordinary amount of modification chiefly in consequence of the great development of his brain and his erect position. Nevertheless, we should bear in mind that he, quote, is but one of several exceptional forms of primates, End quote. Every naturalist who believes in the principle of evolution will grant that the two main divisions of the Simiidae, namely the Catherine and Platherine monkeys, with their subgroups, have all proceeded from some one extremely ancient progenitor. The early descendants of this progenitor, before they had diverged to any considerable extent from each other, would still have formed a single natural group, but some of the species or incipient genera would have already begun to indicate, by their diverging characters, the future distinctive marks of the Catherine and Platherine divisions. Hence, the members of this supposed ancient group would not have been so uniform in their dentition or in the structure of their nostrils as are the existing Catherine monkeys in one way and the Platherines in another way, but would have resembled in this respect the allied Lemuridae, which differ greatly from each other in the form of their muzzles and to an extraordinary degree in their dentition. The Catherine and Platherine monkeys agree in a multitude of characters as is shown by their unquestionably belonging to one and the same order. The many characters which they possess in common can hardly have been independently acquired by so many distinct species, so that these characters must have been inherited. But a naturalist would undoubtedly have ranked as an ape or a monkey an ancient form which possessed many characters common to the Catherine and Platherine monkeys, other characters in an intermediate condition, and some few perhaps distinct from those now found in either group. And as man, from a genealogical point of view, belongs to the Catherine or Old World stock, we must conclude, however much the conclusion may revolt our pride, that our early progenitors would have been properly thus designated but we must not fall into the error of supposing that the early progenitor of the whole simian stock, including man, was identical with or even closely resembled any existing ape or monkey. End of section 15 Recording by Linda Sizemore Section 16 of The Descent of Man Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Descent of Man, Part 1, by Charles Darwin. Chapter 6. On the Affinities and Genealogy of Man, Part 2. On the Birthplace and Antiquity of Man. We are naturally led to inquire 
where was the birthplace of man at that stage of descent when our progenitors diverged from the catarine stock the fact that they belonged to this stock clearly shows that they inhabited the old world but not australia nor any oceanic island as we may infer from the laws of geographical distribution in each great region of the world the living mammals are closely related to the extinct species of the same region it is therefore probable that africa was formerly inhabited by extinct apes closely allied to the gorilla and the chimpanzee and as these two species are now man's nearest allies it is somewhat more probable that our early progenitors lived on the african continent than elsewhere but it is useless to speculate on this subject for two or three anthropomorphous apes one the dryopithecus of larte nearly as large as a man and closely allied to hylobates existed in europe during the miocene age and since so remote a period the earth has certainly undergone many great revolutions and there has been ample time for migration on the largest scale at the period and place whenever and wherever it was when man first lost his hairy covering he probably inhabited a hot country a circumstance favorable for the frugiferous diet on which judging from analogy he subsisted we are far from knowing how long ago it was when man first diverged from the catarine stock but it may have occurred at an epoch as remote as the eocene period for that the higher apes had diverged from the lower apes as early as the upper miocene period is shown by the existence of the dryopithecus we are also quite ignorant at how rapid a rate organisms whether high or low in the scale may be modified under favorable circumstances we know however that some have retained the same form during an enormous lapse of time from what we see going on under domestication we learn that some of the co-descendants of the same species may be not at all some a little and some greatly changed all within the same period thus it may have been with man who has undergone a great amount of modification in certain characters in comparison with the higher apes the great break in the organic chain between man and his nearest allies which cannot be bridged over by any extinct or living species has often been advanced as a grave objection to the belief that man is descended from some lower form but this objection will not appear of much weight to those who from general reasons believe in the general principle of evolution breaks often occur in all parts of the series some being wide sharp and defined others less so in various degrees as between the orang and its nearest allies between the tarsius and the other lemuridae between the elephant and in a more striking manner between the ornithorhynchus or echidna and all other mammals but these breaks depend merely on the number of related forms which have become extinct at some future period not very distant as measured by centuries the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world at the same time the anthropomorphous apes as professor schaffhausen has remarked will no doubt be exterminated the break between man and his nearest allies will then be wider for it will intervene between man in a more civilized state as we may hope even then the caucasian and some ape as low as a baboon instead of as now between the negro or australian and the gorilla with respect to the absence of fossil remains serving to connect man with his ape-like progenitors no one will lay much stress on this fact who reads sir c lyle's discussion where he shows that in all the vertebrate classes the discovery of fossil remains has been a very slow and fortuitous process nor should it be forgotten that those regions which are most likely to afford remains connecting man with some extinct ape-like creature have not as yet been searched by geologists lower stages in the genealogy of man we have seen that man appears to have diverged from the catarine or old world division of the simiadae after these had diverged from the new world division we will now endeavor to follow the remote traces of his genealogy trusting principally to the mutual affinities between the various classes and orders 
with some slight reference to the periods, as far as ascertained, of their successive appearance on the earth. The Lemuridae stand below and near to the Simiidae, and constitute a very distinct family of the primates, or, according to Haeckel and others, a distinct order. This group is diversified and broken to an extraordinary degree, and includes many aberrant forms. It has, therefore, probably suffered much extinction. Most of the remnants survive on islands, such as Madagascar and the Malayan archipelago, where they have not been exposed to so severe a competition as they would have been on well-stocked continents. This group, likewise, presents many gradations, leading, as Huxley remarks, insensibly from the crown and summit of the animal creation down to creatures from which there is but a step, as it seems, to the lowest, smallest, and least intelligent of the placental mammalia. From these various considerations, it is probable that the Simiidae were originally developed from the progenitors of the existing Lemuridae, and these in their turn from forms standing very low in the mammalian series. The marsupials stand in many important characters below the placental mammals. They appeared at a much earlier geological period, and their range was formerly much more extensive than at present. Hence, the placentata are generally supposed to have been derived from the implacentata, or marsupials, not, however, from forms closely resembling the existing marsupials, but from their early progenitors. The monotremata are plainly allied to the marsupials, forming a third and still lower division in the great mammalian series. They are represented at the present day solely by the ornithorhynchus and echidna, and these two forms may be safely considered as relics of a much larger group, representatives of which have been preserved in Australia through some favorable concurrence of circumstances. The monotremata are eminently interesting as leading in several important points of structure towards the class of reptiles. In attempting to trace the genealogy of the mammalia, and therefore of man, lower down in the series, we become involved in greater and greater obscurity. But as a most capable judge, Mr. Parker has remarked, we have good reason to believe that no true bird or reptile intervenes in the direct line of descent. He who wishes to see what ingenuity and knowledge can effect may consult Professor Haeckel's works. Professor Huxley, in reviewing this latter work, says that he considers the phylum or lines of descent of the vertebrata to be admirably discussed by Haeckel, although he differs on some points. He expresses also his high estimate of the general tenor and spirit of the whole work. I will content myself with a few general remarks. Every evolutionist will admit that the five great vertebrate classes, namely mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fishes, are descended from some one prototype, for they have much in common, especially during their embryonic state. As the class of fishes is the most lowly organized and appeared before the others, we may conclude that all the members of the vertebrate kingdom are derived from some fish-like animal. The belief that animals so distinct as a monkey, an elephant, a hummingbird, a snake, a frog, and a fish, etc., could all have sprung from the same parents, will appear monstrous to those who have not attended to the recent progress of natural history. For this belief implies the former existence of links binding closely together all these forms, now so utterly unlike. Nevertheless, it is certain that groups of animals have existed, or do now exist, which serve to connect several of the great vertebrate classes more or less closely. We have seen that the ornithorhynchus graduates toward reptiles, and Professor Huxley has discovered, and is confirmed by Mr. Cope and others, that the dinosaurians are in many important characters intermediate between certain reptiles and certain birds, the birds referred to being the ostrich tribe, itself evidently a widely diffused remnant of a larger group, and the Archaeopteryx, that strange secondary bird with a long lizard-like tail. Again, according to Professor Owen, the ichthyosaurians, great sea lizards, furnished with paddles, present many affinities with fishes, 
or rather, according to Huxley, with amphibians, a class which, including in its highest division frogs and toads, is plainly allied to the ganoid fishes. These latter fishes swarmed during the earlier geological periods and were constructed on what is called a generalized type, that is, they presented diversified affinities with other groups of organisms. The Lepidosiren is also so closely allied to amphibians and fishes that naturalists long disputed in which of these two classes to rank it. It and also some few ganoid fishes have been preserved from utter extinction by inhabiting rivers, which are harbors of refuge, and are related to the great waters of the ocean in the same way that islands are to continents. Lastly, one single member of the immense and diversified class of fishes, namely the lancelet or amphioxus, is so different from all other fishes that Haeckel maintains that it ought to form a distinct class in the vertebrate kingdom. This fish is remarkable for its negative characters. It can hardly be said to possess a brain, vertebral column, or heart, etc., so that it was classed by the older naturalists amongst the worms. Many years ago, Professor Goodsir perceived that the lancelet presented some affinities with the ascidians, which are invertebrate, hermaphrodite marine creatures, permanently attached to a support. They hardly appear like animals, and consist of a simple, tough, leathery sac with two small projecting orifices. They belong to the molluscoida of Huxley, a lower division of the great kingdom of the mollusca, but they have recently been placed by some naturalists amongst the vermes, or worms. Their larvae somewhat resemble tadpoles in shape, and have the power of swimming freely about. Footnote. At the Falkland Islands, I had the satisfaction of seeing, in April 1833, and therefore some years before any other naturalist, the locomotive larvae of a compound ascidian, closely allied to the Sinoicum, but apparently generically distinct from it. The tail was about five times as long as the oblong head, and terminated in a very fine filament. It was, as sketched by me under a simple microscope, plainly divided by transverse opaque partitions, which I presume represent the great cells figured by Kovalevsky. At an early stage of development, the tail was closely coiled round the head of the larva. End of footnote. Mr. Kovalevsky has lately observed that the larvae of ascidians are related to the vertebrata, in their manner of development, in the relative position of the nervous system, and in possessing a structure closely like the corda dorsalis of vertebrate animals. And in this he has been since confirmed by Professor Kupfer. M. Kovalevsky writes to me from Naples that he has now carried these observations yet further, and should his results be well established, the whole will form a discovery of the very greatest value. Thus, if we may rely on embryology, ever the safest guide in classification, it seems that we have at last gained a clue to the source whence the vertebrata were derived. Footnote. I am bound to add that some competent judges dispute this conclusion. For instance, M. Giard, in a series of papers in the Archive de Zoologie Experimentale for 1872. Nevertheless, this naturalist remarks, page 281, quote, La organisation de la lave acidienne en duo de toute hypothèse et de toute théorie nous montre comment la nature peut produire la disposition fondamentale du type vertébré l'existence d'un corps dorsal, chaise en évotébré par la sous-condition vitale de l'adaptation et ses simples possibilités du passage suppriment l'abîme entre les deux sourignes, encore bien qu'on ignore par où le passage s'est fait en réalité. Unquote. End of footnote. We should then be justified in believing that at an extremely remote period a group of animals existed resembling in many respects the larvae of our present ascidians, which diverged into two great branches, the one retrograding in development and producing the present class of ascidians, the other rising to the crown and summit of the animal kingdom by giving birth to the vertebrata. 
we have thus far endeavoured rudely to trace the genealogy of the vertebrata by the aid of their mutual affinities we will now look to man as he exists and we shall i think be able partially to restore the structure of our early progenitors during successive periods but not in due order of time this can be effected by means of the rudiments which man still retains by the characters which occasionally make their appearance in him through reversion and by the aid of the principles of morphology and embryology the various facts to which i shall here allude have been given in the previous chapters the early progenitors of man must have been once covered with hair both sexes having beards their ears were probably pointed and capable of movement and their bodies were provided with a tail having the proper muscles their limbs and bodies were also acted on by many muscles which now only occasionally reappear but are normally present in the quadrumana at this or some earlier period the great artery and nerve of the humerus ran through a supracondyloid foramen the intestine gave forth a much larger diverticulum or cecum than that now existing the foot was then prehensile judging from the condition of the great toe in the fetus and our progenitors no doubt were arboreal in their habits and frequented some warm forest-clad land the males had great canine teeth which served them as formidable weapons at a much earlier period the uterus was double the excreta were voided through a cloaca and the eye was protected by a third eyelid or nictitating membrane at a still earlier period the progenitors of man must have been aquatic in their habits for morphology plainly tells us that our lungs consist of a modified swim bladder which once served as a float the clefts on the neck in the embryo of man show where the branchia once existed in the lunar or weekly recurrent periods of some of our functions we apparently still retain traces of our primordial birthplace a shore washed by the tides at about this same early period the true kidneys were replaced by the corpora wolfiana the heart existed as a simple pulsating vessel and the corda dorsalis took the place of a vertebral column these early ancestors of man thus seen in the dim recesses of time must have been as simply or even still more simply organized than the lancelet or amphioxus there is one other point deserving a fuller notice it has long been known that in the vertebrate kingdom one sex bears rudiments of various accessory parts appertaining to the reproductive system which properly belong to the opposite sex and it has now been ascertained that at a very early embryonic period both sexes possess true male and female glands hence some remote progenitor of the whole vertebrate kingdom appears to have been hermaphrodite or androgynous Footnote. This is the conclusion of Professor Gegenbauer, one of the highest authorities in comparative anatomy. The result has been arrived at chiefly from the study of the amphibia, but it appears from the researches of Waldayer that the sexual organs of even the higher vertebrata are in their early condition hermaphrodite. Similar views have long been held by some authors, though until recently without a firm basis. End of footnote but here we encounter a singular difficulty in the mammalian class the males possess rudiments of a uterus with the adjacent passage in their vesiculae prostaticae they also bear rudiments of mammae and some male marsupials have traces of a marsupial sac footnote the male thalassinus offers the best instance End of footnote. other analogous facts could be added are we then to suppose that some extremely ancient mammal continued androgynous after it had acquired the chief distinctions of its class and therefore after it had diverged from the lower classes of the vertebrate kingdom this seems very improbable for we have to look to fishes the lowest of all the classes to find any still existent androgynous forms footnote hermaphroditism has been observed in several species of Ceranus as well as in some other fishes where it is either normal and symmetrical or abnormal and unilateral dr zudovine has given me references on this subject 
more especially to a paper by Professor Halbertsma in the Transactions of the Dutch Academy of Sciences, volume 16. Dr. Gunther doubts the fact, but it has now been recorded by too many good observers to be any longer disputed. Dr. M. Lesona writes to me that he has verified the observations made by Cavolini on Serranus. Professor Ercolani has recently shown that eels are androgynous. End of footnote. That various accessory parts proper to each sex are found in a rudimentary condition in the opposite sex may be explained by such organs having been gradually acquired by the one sex and then transmitted in a more or less imperfect state to the other. When we treat of sexual selection, we shall meet with innumerable instances of this form of transmission, as in the case of the spurs, plumes, and brilliant colors acquired for battle or ornament by male birds, and inherited by the females in an imperfect or rudimentary condition. The possession by male mammals of functionally imperfect mammary organs is in some respects especially curious. The monotremata have the proper milk-secreting glands with orifices, but no nipples, and as these animals stand at the very base of the mammalian series, it is probable that the progenitors of the class also had milk-secreting glands, but no nipples. This conclusion is supported by what is known of their manner of development, for Professor Turner informs me, on the authority of Kolliker and Langer, that in the embryo the mammary glands can be distinctly traced before the nipples are in the least visible, and the development of successive parts in the individual generally represents and accords with the development of successive beings in the same line of descent. The marsupials differ from the monotremata by possessing nipples, so that probably these organs were first acquired by the marsupials, after they had diverged from and risen above the monotremata and were then transmitted to the placental mammals. Footnote. Professor Gegenbauer has shown that two distinct types of nipples prevail throughout the several mammalian orders, but that it is quite intelligible how both could have been derived from the nipples of the marsupials, and the latter from those of the monotremata. End of footnote. No one will suppose that the marsupials still remained androgynous after they had approximately acquired their present structure. How then are we to account for male mammals possessing mammae? It is possible that they were first developed in the females and then transferred to the males, but from what follows this is hardly probable. It may be suggested, as another view, that long after the progenitors of the whole mammalian class had ceased to be androgynous, both sexes yielded milk, and thus nourished their young, and in the case of the marsupials, that both sexes carried their young in marsupial sacs. This will not appear altogether improbable, if we reflect that the males of existing cygnathus fishes receive the eggs of the females in their abdominal pouches, hatch them, and afterwards, as some believe, nourish the young. Footnote. Mr. Lockwood believes from what he has observed of the development of hippocampus, that the walls of the abdominal pouch of the male in some way afford nourishment. On male fishes hatching the ova in their mouths, see a very interesting paper by Professor Wyman, Dr. Gunther has likewise described similar cases. End of footnote. That other certain male fishes hatch the eggs within their mouths, or branchial cavities that certain male toads take the chaplets of eggs from the females and wind them round their own thighs, keeping them there until the tadpoles are born, that certain male birds undertake the whole duty of incubation, and that male pigeons, as well as the females, feed their nestlings with a secretion from their crops. But the above suggestion first occurred to me from mammary glands of male mammals being so much more perfectly developed than the rudiments of the other accessory reproductive parts, which are found in the one sex, though proper to the other. The mammary glands and nipples, as they exist in male mammals, can indeed hardly be called rudimentary. They are merely not fully developed, and not functionally active. They are sympathetically affected under the influence of certain diseases, like the same organs in the female. 
they often secrete a few drops of milk at birth and at puberty. This latter fact occurred in the curious case, before referred to, where a young man possessed two pairs of mammae. In man and some other male mammals, these organs have been known occasionally to become so well developed during maturity as to yield a fair supply of milk. Now, if we suppose that during a former prolonged period, male mammals aided the females in nursing their offspring, and that afterwards from some cause, as from the production of a smaller number of young, the males cease to give this aid, disuse of the organs during maturity would lead to their becoming inactive, and from two well-known principles of inheritance. This state of inactivity would probably be transmitted to the males at the corresponding age of maturity, but at an earlier age these organs would be left unaffected, so that they would be almost equally well developed in the young of both sexes. Conclusion Von Baer has defined advancement or progress in the organic scale better than anyone else, as resting on the amount of differentiation and specialization of the several parts of a being, when arrived at maturity, as I should be inclined to add. Now, as organisms have become slowly adapted to diversified lines of life by means of natural selection, their parts will have become more and more differentiated and specialized for various functions, from the advantage gained by the division of physiological labor. The same part appears often to have been modified first for one purpose, and then long afterwards for some other and quite distinct purpose, and thus all the parts are rendered more and more complex. But each organism still retains the general type of structure of the progenitor from which it was aboriginally derived. In accordance with this view, it seems, if we turn to geological evidence, that organization on the whole has advanced throughout the world by slow and interrupted steps. In the great kingdom of the vertebrata, it has culminated in man. It must not, however, be supposed that groups of organic beings are always supplanted and disappear as soon as they have given birth to other and more perfect groups. The latter, though victorious over their predecessors, may not have become better adapted for all places in the economy of nature. Some old forms appear to have survived from inhabiting protected sites where they have not been exposed to very severe competition, and these often aid us in constructing our genealogies by giving us a fair idea of former and lost populations. But we must not fall into the error of looking at the existing members of any lowly organized group as perfect representatives of their ancient predecessors. The most ancient progenitors in the kingdom of the vertebrata, at which we are able to obtain an obscure glance, apparently consisted of a group of marine animals resembling the larvae of existing ascidians. Footnote. The inhabitants of the seashore must be greatly affected by the tides animals living either about the mean high water mark or about the mean low water mark pass through a complete cycle of tidal changes in a fortnight consequently their food supply will undergo marked changes week by week the vital functions of such animals living under these conditions for many generations can hardly fail to run their course in regular weekly periods now it is a mysterious fact that in the higher and now terrestrial vertebrata as well as in other classes. Many normal and abnormal processes have one or more whole weeks as their periods. This would be rendered intelligible if the vertebrata were descended from an animal allied to the existing tidal ascidians. Many instances of such periodic processes might be given, as the gestation of mammals, the duration of fevers, etc. The hatching of eggs affords also a good example for according to Mr. Bartlett, the eggs of the pigeon are hatched in two weeks, those of the fowl in three, those of the duck in four, those of the goose in five, and those of the ostrich in seven weeks. As far as we can judge, a recurrent period, if approximately of the right duration for any process or function, would not, when once gained, be liable to change. Consequently, it might be thus transmitted through almost any number of generations. But if the function changed, the period would have to change, 
and would be apt to change almost abruptly by a whole week this conclusion if sound is highly remarkable for the period of gestation in each mammal and the hatching of each bird's eggs and many other vital processes thus betray to us the primordial birthplace of these animals End of footnote. these animals probably gave rise to a group of fishes as lowly organized as the lancelet and from these ganoids and other fishes like the lepidosiren must have been developed from such fish a very small advance would carry us on to the amphibians we have seen that birds and reptiles were once intimately connected together and the monotremata now connect mammals with reptiles in a slight degree but no one can at present say by what line of descent the three higher and related classes namely mammals birds and reptiles were derived from the two lower vertebrate classes namely amphibians and fishes in the class of mammals the steps are not difficult to conceive which led from the ancient monotremata to the ancient marsupials and from these to the early progenitors of the placental mammals we may thus ascend to the lemuridae and the interval is not very wide from these to the simiidae the simiidae then branched off into two great stems the new world and old world monkeys and from the latter at a remote period man the wonder and glory of the universe proceeded thus we have given to man a pedigree of prodigious length but not it may be said of noble quality the world it has often been remarked appears as if it had long been preparing for the advent of man and this in one sense is strictly true for he owes his birth to a long line of progenitors if any single link in this chain had never existed man would not have been exactly what he is now unless we wilfully close our eyes we may with our present knowledge approximately recognize our parentage nor need we feel ashamed of it the most humble organism is something much higher than the inorganic dust under our feet and no one with an unbiased mind can study any living creature however humble without being struck with enthusiasm at its marvelous structure and properties. End of section 16. Section 17 of The Descent of Man, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Ballard Johansson. The Descent of Man, Part 1, by Charles Darwin. Chapter 7, On the Races of Man, Part 1. The Nature and Value of Specific Characters, Application to the Races of Man, Arguments in Favor of and Opposed to Ranking the So-Called Races of Man as District Species, Subspecies, Monogenesists and Polygenesists, Convergence of Character, numerous points of resemblance in body and mind between the most distinct races of man the state of man when he first spread over the earth each race not descended from a single pair the extinction of races the formation of races the effects of crossing slight influence of the direct action of the conditions of life slight or no influence of natural selection sexual selection it is not my intention here to describe the several so-called races of men but I am about to inquire what is the value of the differences between them under a classificatory point of view, and how they have originated. In determining whether two or more allied forms ought to be ranked as species or varieties, naturalists are practically guided by the following considerations, namely, the amount of difference between them, and whether such differences relate to few or many points of structure, and whether they are of physiological importance, but more especially whether they are constant constancy of character is what is chiefly valued and sought for by naturalists whenever it may be shown or rendered probable that the forms in question have remained distinct for a long period this becomes an argument of much weight in favor of treating them as species even a slight degree of sterility between any two forms when first crossed or in their offspring is generally considered as a decisive test of their specific distinctness and their continued persistence without blending within the same area is usually accepted as sufficient evidence either of some degree of mutual sterility or in the case of animals of some mutual repugnance to pairing 
independently of fusion from intercrossing, the complete absence, in a well-investigated region, of varieties linking together any two closely allied forms is probably the most important of all the criterions of their specific distinctness, and this is a somewhat different consideration from mere constancy of character, for two forms may be highly variable and yet not yield intermediate varieties. Geographical distribution is often brought into play unconsciously, and sometimes consciously, so that forms living in two widely separated areas in which most of the other inhabitants are specifically distinct are themselves usually looked at as distinct but in truth this affords no aid in distinguishing geographical races from so-called good or true species now let us apply these generally admitted principles to the races of man viewing him in the same spirit as a naturalist would any other animal in regard to the amount of difference between the races we must make allowance for our nice powers of discrimination gained by the long habit of observing ourselves in indian as elphinstone remarks although a newly arrived european cannot at first distinguish the various native races yet they soon appear to him extremely dissimilar father ripa makes exactly the same remark with respect to the chinese and the hindu cannot at first perceive any difference between the several european nations even the most distinct races of men are much more like each other in form than would at first be supposed certain negro tribes must be expected whilst others as dr rolfs writes to me and as i have myself seen have caucasian features this general similarity is well shown by the french photographs in the collection anthropologique du museum de paris of the men belonging to various races the greater number of which might pass for europeans as many persons to whom i have shown them have remarked nevertheless these men if seen alive would undoubtedly appear very distinct so that we are clearly much influenced in our judgment by the mere color of the skin and hair by slight differences in the features and by expression there is however no doubt that the various races when carefully compared and measured differ much more from each other as in the texture of the hair the relative proportions of all parts of the body the capacity of the lungs the form and capacity of the skull and even in the convolutions of the brain but it would be an endless task to specify the numerous points of difference the races differ also in constitution in acclimatization and in liability to certain diseases their mental characteristics are likewise very distinct chiefly as it would appear in their emotional but partly in their intellectual faculties every one who has had the opportunity of comparison must have been struck with the contrast between the taciturn even morose aborigines of south america and the light-hearted talkative negroes there is a nearly similar contrast between the malays and the papuans who live under the same physical conditions and are separated from each other only by a narrow space of sea we will first consider the arguments which may be advanced in favor of classing the races of man as distinct species and then the arguments on the other side if a naturalist who had never before seen a negro hottentot australian or mongolian were to compare them he would at once perceive that they differed in a multitude of characters some of slight and some of considerable importance on inquiry he would find that they were adapted to live under widely different climates and that they differed somewhat in bodily constitution and mental disposition if he were then told that hundreds of similar specimens could be brought from the same countries he would as surely declare that they were as good species as many to which he had been in the habit of affixing specific names this conclusion would be greatly strengthened as soon as he had ascertained that these forms had all retained the same character for many centuries and that negroes apparently identical with existing negroes had lived at least four thousand years ago with respect to the figures in the famous Egyptian caves of Abu Simbel, M. Pouchet says that he was far from finding recognizable representations of the dozen or more nations which some authors believe that they can recognize. Even some of the most strongly marked races cannot be identified with that degree of unanimity which might have been expected from what has been written on the subject. Thus, Mr. Knott and Glidden state that Rameses II, or the Great, has features superbly European, whereas Knox, another firm believer in the specific distinctness of the races of man speaking of young memnon the same as rameses the second as i am informed by mr birch insists in the strongest manner that he is identical in character with the jews of antwerp again when i looked at the statue of amenoff the third i agreed with two officers of the establishment both competent judges that he had a strongly marked negro type of features but mr snott and glidden describe him as a hybrid but not of negro intermixture he would also hear on the authority of an excellent observer, Dr. Lund, as quoted by Knott and Glidden, Types of Mankind, 1854, page 439, 
they give also corroborative evidence but c vaught thinks that the subject requires further investigation that the human skulls found in the caves of brazil entombed with many extinct mammals belong to the same type as that now prevailing throughout the american continent our naturalist would then perhaps turn to geographical distribution and he would probably declare that those forms must be distinct species which differ not only in appearance but are fitted for hot as well as damp or dry countries and for the arctic regions he might appeal to the fact that no species in the group next to man namely the quadrumana can resist a low temperature or any considerable change of climate and that the species which come nearest to man have never been reared to maturity even under the temperate climate of europe he would be deeply impressed with the fact first noticed by agassiz that the different races of man are distributed over the world in the same zoological provinces as those inhabited by undoubtedly distinct species and genera of mammals this is manifestly the case with the australian mongolian and negro races of man in a less well-marked manner with the hottentots but plainly with the papuans and malays who are separated as mr wallace has shown by nearly the same line which divides the great malayan and australian zoological provinces the aborigines of america range throughout the continent and this at first appears opposed to the above rule for most of the productions of the southern and northern halves differ widely yet some few living forms as the opossum range from one into the other as did formerly some of the gigantic edentata the eskimo like other arctic animals extend round the whole polar regions it would be observed that the amount of difference between the mammals of the several zoological provinces does not correspond with the degree of separation between the latter so that it can hardly be considered as an anomaly that the negro differs more and the american much less from the other races of man than do the mammals of the african and american continents from the mammals of other provinces man it may be added does not appear to have aboriginally inhabited any oceanic island and in this respect he resembles the other members of his class in determining whether the supposed varieties of the same kind of domestic animal should be ranked as such or as specifically distinct that is whether any of them are descended from distinct wild species every naturalist would lay much stress on the fact of their external parasites being specifically distinct all the more stress would be laid on this fact as it would be an exceptional one for i am informed by mr denny that the most different kinds of dogs fowls and pigeons in england are infested by the same species of pediculi or lice now mr a murray has carefully examined the pediculi collected in different countries from the different races of man and he finds that they differ not only in color but in the structure of their claws and limbs and in every case in which many specimens were obtained the differences were constant the surgeon of a whaling ship in the pacific assured me that when the pediculi with which some sandwich islanders on board swarmed strayed on to the bodies of the english sailors they died in the course of three or four days these pediculi were darker colored and appeared different from those proper to the natives of chile in south america of which he gave me specimens these again appeared larger and much softer than european lice mr murray procured four kinds from africa namely from the negroes of the eastern and western coast from the hottentots and kaffirs two kinds from the natives of australia two from north and two from south america in these latter cases it may be presumed that the pediculi came from natives inhabiting different districts with insects slight structural differences if constant are generally esteemed of specific value and the fact of the races of man being infested by parasites which appear to be specifically distinct may fairly be urged as an argument that the races themselves ought to be classed as distinct species our supposed naturalist having proceeded thus far in his investigation would next inquire whether the races of men when crossed were in any degree sterile he might consult the work of professor Braca, a cautious and philosophical observer and in this he would find good evidence that some races were quite fertile together but evidence of an opposite nature in regard to other races thus it has been asserted that the native women of australia and tasmania rarely produce children to european men the evidence however on this head has now been shown to be almost valueless the half-castes are killed by the pure blacks and an account has lately been published of eleven half-caste youths murdered and burned at the same time whose remains were found by the police in this letter count jerlecki's statement that australian women who have borne children to a white man are afterwards sterile with their own race is disproved m a de quachefage has also collected much evidence that australians and europeans are not sterile when crossed again it has 
often been said that when mulattoes intermarry they produce few children on the other hand dr bachman of charleston positively asserts that he has known mulatto families which have intermarried for several generations and have continued on an average as fertile as either pure whites or pure blacks inquiries formerly made by sir c lyle on this subject led him as he informs me to the same conclusion dr rolfs writes to me that he found the mixed races in the great sahara derived from arabs berbers and negroes of three tribes extraordinarily fertile on the other hand mr winwood reed informs me that the negroes on the gold coast though admiring white men and mulattoes have a maxim that mulattoes should not intermarry as the children are few and sickly this belief as mr reed remarks deserves attention as white men have visited and resided on the gold coast for four hundred years so that the natives have had ample time to gain knowledge through experience in the united states the census for the year eighteen fifty four included according to dr bachman four hundred and five thousand seven hundred fifty one mulattoes and this number considering all the circumstances of the case seems small but it may partly be accounted for by the degraded and anomalous position of the class and by the profligacy of the women a certain amount of absorption of mulattoes into negroes must always be in progress and this would lead to an apparent diminution of the former the inferior vitality of mulattoes is spoken of in a trustworthy work as a well-known phenomenon and this although a different consideration from their less infertility may perhaps be advanced as a proof of the specific distinctness of the parent races no doubt both animal and vegetable hybrids when produced from extremely distinct species are liable to premature death and the parents of the mulattoes cannot be put under the category of extremely distinct species the common mule so notorious for long life and vigor and yet so sterile shows how little necessary condition there is in hybrids between less fertility and vitality other analogous cases could be cited even if it should hereafter be proved that all the races of men were perfectly fertile together he who was inclined from other reasons to rank them as distinct species might with justice argue that fertility and sterility are not safe criterions of specific distinctness we know that these qualities are easily affected by changed conditions of life or by close interbreeding and that they are governed by highly complex laws for instance that of the unequal fertility of converse crosses between the same two species with forms which must be ranked as undoubted species a perfect series exists from those which are absolutely sterile when crossed to those which are almost or completely fertile the degrees of sterility do not coincide strictly with the degrees of difference between the parents in external structure or habits of life man in many respects may be compared with those animals which have long been domesticated and a large body of evidence can be advanced in favor of the palazian doctrine i may here remind the reader that the sterility of species when crossed is not a specially acquired quality but like the incapacity of certain trees to be grafted together is incidental on other acquired differences the nature of these differences is unknown but they relate more especially to the reproductive system and much less so to external structure or to ordinary differences in constitution one important element in the sterility of crossed species apparently lies in one or both having been long habituated in fixed conditions for we know that changed conditions have a special influence on the reproductive system and we have good reason to believe as before remarked that the fluctuating conditions of domestication tend to eliminate that sterility which is so general with species in a natural state when crossed it has elsewhere been shown by me that the sterility of cross species has not been acquired through natural selection we can see that when two forms have already been rendered very sterile it is scarcely possible that their sterility could be augmented by the preservation or survival of the more and more sterile individuals for as the sterility increases fewer and fewer offspring will be produced from which to breed and at last only single individuals will be produced at the rarest intervals there is an even higher grade of sterility than this both gartner and colruder have proved that in genera of plants including many species a series can be formed from species which when crossed yield fewer and fewer seeds to species which never produce a single seed but yet are affected by the pollen of the other species as shown by the swelling of the german it is here manifestly impossible to select the more sterile individuals which have already ceased to yield seeds so that the acme of sterility when the german alone is affected cannot have been gained through selection 
This acme, and no doubt the other grades of sterility, are the incidental results of certain unknown differences in the constitution of the reproductive system of the species which are crossed. That domestication tends to eliminate the sterility which is so general a result of the crossing of the species in a state of nature. From these several considerations, it may be justly urged that the perfect fertility of the intercrossed races of man, if established, would not absolutely preclude us from ranking them as distinct species. Independently of fertility, the characters presented by the offspring from a cross have been thought to indicate whether or not the parent forms ought to be ranked as species or varieties, but after carefully studying the evidence, I have come to the conclusion that no general rules of this kind can be trusted. The ordinary result of a cross is the production of a blended or intermediate form, but in certain cases some of the offspring take closely after one parent form and some after the other. This is especially apt to occur when the parents differ in characters which first appear as sudden variations or monstrosities. I refer to this point because Dr. Rolfs informs me that he has frequently seen in Africa the offspring of Negroes crossed with members of other races, either completely black or completely white, or rarely piebald. On the other hand, it is notorious that in America, mulattoes commonly present an intermediate appearance. We have now seen that a naturalist might feel himself fully justified in ranking the races of man as distinct species, for he has found that they are distinguished by many differences in structure and constitution, some being of importance. These differences have, also, remained nearly constant for very long periods of time. Our naturalists will have been in some degree influenced by the enormous range of man, which is a great anomaly in the class of mammals, if mankind be viewed as a single species. He will have been struck with the distribution of the several so-called races, which accords with that of other undoubtedly distinct species of mammals. Finally, he might urge that the mutual fertility of all races has not as yet been fully proved, and even if proved, would not be an absolute proof of their specific identity. On the other side of the question, if our supposed naturalists were to inquire whether the forms of man keep distinct like ordinary species when mingled together in large numbers in the same country, he would immediately discover that this was by no means the case. In Brazil, he would behold an immense mongrel population of Negroes and Portuguese. In Chile and other parts of South America, he would behold the whole population consisting of Indians and Spaniards blended in various degrees. M. de Quachefage has given an interesting account of the success and energy of the Paulistas in Brazil, who are a much-crossed race of Portuguese and Indians, with a mixture of the blood of other races. In many parts of the same continent, he would meet with the most complex crosses between Negroes, Indians, and Europeans, and judging from the vegetable kingdom, such triple crosses afford the severest test of mutual fertility of the parent forms. In one island of the Pacific, we would find a small population of mingled Polynesian and English blood, and in the Fiji archipelago, Pelago, a population of Polynesian and Negritos crossed in all degrees. Many analogous cases could be added, for instance, in Africa. Hence, the races of man are not sufficiently distinct to inhabit the same country without fusion, and the absence of fusion affords the usual and best test of specific distinctness. Our naturalist would likewise be much disturbed as soon as he perceived that the distinctive characters of all the races were highly variable. This fact strikes everyone on first beholding the Negro slaves in Brazil, who have been imported from all parts of Africa. The same remark holds good with the Polynesians, and with many other races. It may be doubted whether any character can be named which is distinctive of a race and is constant. Savages, even within the limits of the same tribe, are not nearly so uniform in character as has been often asserted. Hottentot women offer certain peculiarities more strongly marked than those occurring in any other race, but these are known not to be of constant occurrence. In the several American tribes, color and hairiness differ considerably, as does color to a certain degree and the shape of the features greatly in the Negroes of Africa. The shape of the skull varies much in some races. For instance, with the Aborigines of America and Australia, Professor Huxley says, that the skulls of many South Germans and Swiss are as short and as broad as those of the Tartars, etc., and so it is with every other character. Now all naturalists have learnt by dearly bought experience how rash it is to attempt to define species by the aid of inconsistent characters. But the most weighty of all the arguments against treating the races of man as distinct species is that they graduate into each other independently in many cases, as far as we can judge, of their having intercrossed. Man has been studied more carefully than any other animal, and yet there is the greatest possible diversity amongst capable judges whether he should be classed as a single species or race, or as two, viri, as three, chaquinot, 
as four can't five blumenbach six vaughn seven hunter eight agizis eleven pickering fifteen bory st vincent sixteen de moulin twenty two morton sixty crawford or as sixty three according to burke this diversity of judgment does not prove that the races ought to be ranked as species but it shows that they graduate into each other and that it is hardly possible to discover clear distinctive characters between them every naturalist who has had the misfortune to undertake the description of a group of highly varying organisms has encountered cases i speak after experience precisely like that of man and if of a cautious disposition he will end by uniting all forms which graduate into each other under a single species for he will say to himself that he has no right to give names to objects which he cannot define cases of this kind occur in the order which includes man namely in certain genera of monkeys whilst in other genera as in the cercopithecus most of the species can be determined with certainty in the american genus cebus the various forms are ranked by some naturalists as species by others as mere geographical races now if numerous specimens of cebus were collected from all parts of south america and those forms which at present appear to be specifically distinct were found to graduate into each other by close steps they would usually be ranked as mere varieties or races and this course has been followed by most naturalists with respect to the races of man nevertheless it must be confessed that there are forms at least in the vegetable kingdom professor nigelli has carefully described several striking cases professor also gray has made analogous remarks on some intermediate forms in the compositae of north america which we cannot avoid naming as species but which are connected together by numberless gradations independently of intercrossing some naturalists have lately employed the term subspecies to designate forms which possess many of the characteristics of true species but which hardly deserve so high a rank now if we reflect on the weighty arguments above given for raising the races of man to the dignity of species and the insuperable difficulties on the other side in defining them it seems that the term subspecies might here be used with propriety but from long habit the term race will perhaps always be employed the choice of terms is only so far important in that it is desirable to use as far as possible the same terms for the same degrees of difference unfortunately this can rarely be done for the larger genera generally include closely allied forms which can be distinguished only with much difficulty whilst the smaller genera within the same family include forms that are perfectly distinct yet all must be ranked equally as species so again species within the same large genus by no means resemble each other to the same degree on the contrary some of them can generally be arranged in little groups round other species like satellites round planets End of section 17section 18 of the descent of man part 1 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the descent of man part 1 by charles darwin chapter 7 on the races of man part 2 the question whether mankind consists of one or several species has of late years been much discussed by anthropologists who are divided into the two schools of monogenists and polygenists these who do not admit the principle of evolution must look at species as separate creations or in some manner as distinct entities and they must decide what forms of man they will consider as species by the analogy of the method commonly pursued in ranking other organic beings as species but it is a hopeless endeavour to decide this point until some definition of the term species is generally accepted and the definition must not include an indeterminate element such as an act of creation we might as well attempt without any definition to decide whether a certain number of houses should be called a village town or city we have a practical illustration of the difficulty in the never-ending doubts whether many closely allied mammals birds insects and plants which represent each other respectively in north america and europe should be ranked as species or geographical races 
and the like holds true of the productions of many islands situated at some little distance from the nearest continent. Those naturalists, on the other hand, who admit the principle of evolution, and this is now admitted by the majority of rising men, will feel no doubt that all the races of men are descended from a single primitive stock, whether or not they may think fit to designate the races as distinct species, for the sake of expressing their amount of difference. With our domestic animals, the question whether the various races have arisen from one or more species is somewhat different. Although it may be admitted that all the races, as well as all the natural species, within the same genus, have sprung from the same primitive stock, yet it is a fit subject for discussion, whether all the domestic races of the dog, for instance, have acquired their present amount of difference since some one species was first domesticated by man, or whether they owe some of their characters to inheritance from distinct species which had already been differentiated in a state of nature. With man, no such question can arise, for he cannot be said to have been domesticated at any particular period. During an early stage in the divergence of the races of man from a common stock, the differences between the races and their number must have been small. Consequently, as far as their distinguishing characters are concerned, they then had less claim to rank as distinct species than the existing so-called races. Nevertheless, so arbitrary is the term of species, that such early races would perhaps have been ranked by some naturalists as distinct species, if their differences, although extremely slight, had been more constant than they are at present, and had not graduated into each other. It is, however, possible, though far from probable, that the early progenitors of a man might formerly have diverged much in character, until they became more unlike each other than any now existing races. But that, subsequently, as suggested by Fogt, they converged in character. When man selects the offspring of two distinct species for the same object, he sometimes induces a considerable amount of convergence, as far as general appearance is concerned. This is the case, as shown by von Natusius. with the improved breeds of the pig, which are descendant from two distinct species, and in a less marked manner with the improved breeds of cattle. A great anatomist, Gratiolet, maintains that the anthropomorphous apes do not form a natural subgroup, but that the orang is a highly developed gibbon or semnopithecus, the chimpanzee a highly developed macacus, and the gorilla a highly developed mandrill, if this conclusion, which rests almost exclusively on brain characters, be admitted, we should have a case of convergence, at least in external characters, for the anthropomorphous apes are certainly more like each other in many points than they are to other apes. All analogical resemblances, as of a whale to a fish, may indeed be said to be cases of convergence, but this term has never been applied to superficial and adaptive resemblances. It would, however, be extremely rash to attribute a convergence close similarity of character in many points of structure amongst the modified descendants of widely distinct beings. The form of a crystal is determined solely by the molecular forces, and it is not surprising that dissimilar substances should sometimes assume the same form, but with organic beings we should bear in mind that the form of each depends of an infinity of complex relations, namely on variations, due to causes far too intricate to be followed. On the nature of the variations preserved, these depending on the physical conditions, and still more on the surrounding organisms, which compete with each. And lastly, on inheritance, in itself a fluctuating element, from innumerable progenitors, all of which have had their forms determined through equally complex relations. It appears incredible that the modified descendants of two organisms, if these differed from each other in a marked manner, 
should ever afterwards converge so closely as to lead to a near approach to identity throughout their whole organization. In the case of the convergent races of pigs above referred to, evidence of their descent from two primitive stocks is, according to von Natusius, still plainly retained in certain bones of their skulls. If the races of man had descended, as is supposed by some naturalists, from two or more species, which differed from each other as much, or nearly as much, as does the orang from the gorilla, it can hardly be doubted that marked differences in the structure of certain bones should still be discoverable in man, as he now exists. Although the existing races of man differ in many respects, as in color, hair, shape of skull, proportions of the body, etc., yet if their whole structure be taken into consideration, they are found to resemble each other closely in a multitude of points. Many of these are of so unimportant or of so singular a nature that it is extremely improbable that they should have been independently acquired by aboriginally distinct species or races. The same remark holds good with equal or greater force with respect to the numerous points of mental similarity between the most distinct races of man. The American Aborigines, Negroes, and Europeans are as different from each other in mind as any three races that can be named. Yet I was incessantly struck, whilst living with the Fujians on board the Beagle, with the many little traits of character, showing how similar their minds were to ours, and so it was with a full-blooded negro with whom I happened once to be intimate. He who will read Mr. Tyler's and Sir G. Lubbock's interesting works can hardly fail to be deeply impressed with the close similarity between the men of all races in tastes, dispositions, and habits. This is shown by the pleasure which they all take in dancing, rude music, acting, painting, tattooing, and otherwise decorating themselves, in their mutual comprehension of gesture language, by the same expression in their features, and by the same inarticulate cries when excited by the same emotions. This similarity, or rather identity, is striking, when contrasted with the different expressions and cries made by distinct species of monkeys. There is good evidence that the art of shooting with bows and arrows has not been handed down from any common progenitor of mankind. Yet, as Westroop and Nilsson have remarked, the stone arrowheads, brought from the most distant parts of the world and manufactured at the most remote periods, are almost identical, and this fact can only be accounted for by the various races having similar inventive or mental powers. The same observation has been made by archaeologists with respect to certain widely prevailed ornaments, such as zigzags, etc., and with respect to various simple beliefs and customs, such as the burying of the dead under megalithic structures. I remember observing in South America that there, as in so many other parts of the world, men have generally chosen the summits of lofty hills to throw up piles of stones, either as a record of some remarkable event, or for burying their dead. Now when naturalists observe a close agreement in numerous small details of habits, tastes, and dispositions between two or more domestic races, or between nearly allied natural forms, they use this fact as an argument that they are descended from a common progenitor, who was thus endowed, and consequently that all should be classed under the same species. The same argument may be applied with much force to the races of man. As it is improbable that the numerous and unimportant points of resemblance between the several races of man in bodily structure and mental faculties, I do not here refer to similar customs, should all have been independently acquired, they must have been inherited from progenitors who had these same characters. We thus gain some insight into the early state of man, before he had spread step by step over the face of the earth. The spreading of man to regions widely separated by the sea 
no doubt preceded any great amount of divergence of character in the several races for otherwise we should sometimes meet with the same race in distant continents and this is never the case sir h lubbock after comparing the arts now practised by savages in all parts of the world specifies those which man could not have known when he first wandered from his original birthplace for if once learned they would never have been forgotten he thus shows that the spear which is but a development of the knife point and the club which is but a long hammer are the only things left he admits however that the art of making fire probably had been already discovered for it is common to all the races now existing and was known to the ancient cave inhabitants of europe perhaps the art of making rude canoes or rafts was likewise known but as man existed at a remote epoch when the land in many places stood at a very different level to what it does now he would have been able without the aid of canoes to have spread widely sir h lubbock further remarks how improbable it is that our earliest ancestors could have counted as high as ten considering that so many races now in existence cannot get beyond four nevertheless at this early period the intellectual and social faculties of man could hardly have been inferior in any extreme degree to those possessed at present by the lowest savages otherwise primeval man could not have been so eminently successful in the struggle for life as proved by his early and wide diffusion from the fundamental differences between certain languages some philologists have inferred that when man first became widely diffused he was not a speaking animal but it may be suspected that languages far less perfect than any now spoken aided by gestures might have been used and yet have left no traces on subsequent and more highly developed tongues without the use of same language however imperfect it appears doubtful whether man's intellect could have risen to the standard implied by his dominant position at an early period whether primeval man when he possessed but few arts and those of the rudest kind and when his power of language was extremely imperfect would have deserved to be called man must depend on the definition which we employ in a series of forms graduating insensibly from some ape-like creature to man as he now exists it would be impossible to fix on any definite point where the term man ought to be used but this is a matter of very little importance so again it is almost a matter of indifference whether the so-called races of man are thus designated or are ranked as species or subspecies but the latter term appears the more appropriate finally we may conclude that when the principle of evolution is generally accepted as it surely will be before long the dispute between the monogenists and the polygenists will die a silent and unobserved death one other question ought not to be passed over without notice namely whether as is sometimes assumed each subspecies or race of man has sprung from a single pair of progenitors with our domestic animals a new race can readily be formed by carefully matching the varying offsprings from a single pair or even from a single individual possessing some new character but most of our races have been formed not intentionally from a selected pair but unconsciously by the preservation of many individuals which have varied however slightly in some useful or desired manner if in one country stronger and heavier horses and in another country lighter and fleeter ones were habitually preferred we may feel sure that two distinct sub-breeds would be produced in the course of time without any one pair having been separated and bred from in either country many races have been thus formed and their manner of formation is closely analogous to that of natural species we know also that the horses taken to the Falkland islands have during successive generations become smaller and weaker whilst those which have run wild on the pampas 
have acquired larger and coarser heads, and such changes are manifestly due not to any one pair, but to all the individuals having been subjected to the same conditions, aided perhaps by the principle of reversion. The new sub-breeds in such cases are not descended from any single pair, but from many individuals, which have varied in different degrees, but in the same general manner. And we may conclude that the races of man have been similarly produced, the modifications being either the direct result of exposure to different conditions, or the indirect result of some form of selection. But to this latter subject we shall presently return. On the Extinction of the Races of Man The partial or complete extinction of many races and sub-races of man is historically known. Humboldt saw in South America a parrot, which was the sole living creature that could speak a word of the language of a lost tribe. Ancient monuments and stone implements found in all parts of the world, about which no tradition has been preserved by the present inhabitants, indicate much extinction. Some small and broken tribes, remnants of former races, still survive in isolated and generally mountainous districts. In Europe, the ancient races were all, according to Schaffhausen, lower in the scale than the rudest living savages. They must therefore have differed, to a certain extent, from any existing race. The remains described by Professor Broca from Les Aises, though they unfortunately appear to have belonged to a single family, indicate a race with a most singular combination of low or simious and of high characteristics. This race is entirely different from any other, ancient or modern, that we have heard of. It differed, therefore, from the quaternary race of the caverns of Belgium. Man can long resist conditions which appear extremely unfavorable for his existence. He has long lived in the extreme regions of the north, with no wood for his canoes or implements, and with only blubber as fuel, and melted snow as drink. In the southern extremity of America, the Fugians survive without the protection of clothes, or of any building worthy to be called a hole. In South Africa, the Aborigines wander over arid plains, where dangerous beasts abound. Man can withstand the deadly influence of the Terai, at the foot of the Himalay, and the pestilential shores of tropical Africa. Extinction follows chiefly from the competition of tribe with tribe, and race with race. Various checks are always in action, serving to keep down the number of each savage tribe, such as periodical famines, nomadic habits, and the consequent death of infants, prolonged suckling, wars, accidents, sickness, licentiousness, the stealing of women, infanticide, and especially lessened fertility. If any one of these checks increases in power, even slightly, the tribe thus affected tends to decrease, and when, of two adjoining tribes, one becomes less numerous and less powerful than the other, the contest is soon settled by war, slaughter, cannibalism, slavery, and absorption. Even when a weaker tribe is not thus abruptly swept away, if it once begins to decrease, it generally goes on decreasing, until it becomes extinct. When civilized nations come into contact with barbarians, the struggle is short, except where a deadly climate gives its aid to the native race. Of the causes which lead to the victory of civilized nations, some are plain and simple, others complex and obscure. We can see that the cultivation of the land will be fatal in many ways to savages, for they cannot, or will not, change their habits. New diseases and vices have in some cases proved highly destructive, and it appears that a new disease often causes much death, until those who are most susceptible to its destructive influence are gradually weeded out. And so it may be with the evil effects from spirituous liquors, as well as with the unconquerably strong taste for them shown by so many savages. It further appears, mysterious as is the fact, that the first meeting of distinct and separated people 
generates disease. Mr. Sprout, who in Vancouver, Island, closely attended to the subject of extinction, believed that changed habits of life, consequent on the advent of Europeans, induces much ill health. He lays also great stress on the apparently trifling cause that the natives become bewildered and dull by the new life around them. They lose the motives for exertion and get no new ones in their place. The grade of their civilization seems to be a most important element in the success of competing nations. A few centuries ago, Europe feared the inroads of eastern barbarians. Now any such fear would be ridiculous. It is a more curious fact, as Mr. Bagehot has remarked, that savages did not formerly waste away before the classical nations, as they now do before modern civilized nations. Had they done so, the old moralists would have mused over the event, but there is no lament in any writer of that period over the perishing barbarians. The most potent of all the causes of extinction appears in many cases to be lessened fertility and ill health, especially amongst the children, arising from changed conditions of life, notwithstanding that the new conditions may not be injurious in themselves. I am much indebted to Mr. H. H. Howard for having called my attention to this subject, and for having given me information respecting it. I have collected the following cases. When Tasmania was first colonized, the natives were roughly estimated by some at 7,000, and by others at 20,000. Their number was soon greatly reduced, chiefly by fighting with the English and with each other. After the famous hunt by all the colonists, when the remaining natives delivered themselves up to the government, they consisted only of 120 individuals, who were, in 1832, transported to Flinders Island. This island, situated between Tasmania and Australia, is 40 miles long, and from 12 to 18 miles broad. It seems healthy, and the natives were well treated. Nevertheless, they suffered greatly in health. In 1834, they consisted of 47 adult males, 48 adult females, and 16 children, or in all, of 111 souls. In 1835, only 100 were left, as they continued rapidly to decrease, and as they themselves thought that they should not perish so quickly elsewhere, they were removed in 1847 to Oyster Co. in the southern part of Tasmania. They then consisted, December the 20th, 1847, of 14 men, 22 women and 10 children. But the change of sight did no good, disease and death still pursued them, and in 1864 one man, who died in 1869, and three elderly women alone survived. The infertility of the woman is even a more remarkable fact than the liability of all to ill health and death. At the time when only nine women were left at Oyster Co., they told Mr. Bonwick that only two had ever borne children, and these two had together produced only three children. With respect to the cause of this extraordinary state of things, Dr. Story remarks that death followed the attempts to civilize the natives. If left to themselves, to roam as they were wont and undisturbed, they would have reared more children, and there would have been less mortality. Another careful observer of the natives, Mr. Davis, remarks, The births have been few and the deaths numerous. This may have been in a great measure owing to their change of living and food, but more so to their banishment from the mainland of Van Diemen's land and consequent depression of spirits. Similar facts have been observed in two widely different parts of Australia. The celebrated explorer, Mr. Gregory, told Mr. Bonwick that in Queensland the want of reproduction was being already felt with the blacks, even in the most recently settled parts, and that decay would set in. Of thirteen aborigines from Sharks Bay, who visited Murchison River, twelve died of consumption within three months. The decrease of the Maoris of New Zealand has been carefully investigated by Mr. Fenton in an admirable report, 
from which all the following statements, with one exception, are taken. The decrease in number since 1830 is admitted by everyone, including the natives themselves, and is still steadily progressing. Although it has hitherto been found impossible to take an actual census of the natives, their numbers were carefully estimated by residents in many districts. The result seems trustworthy, and shows that during the fourteen years previous to 1858, the decrease was 19.42 per cent. Some of the tribes thus carefully examined lived about a hundred miles apart, some of the coast, some inland, and their means of subsistence and habits differed to a certain extent. The total number in 1858 was believed to be 53,700, and in 1872, after a second interval of fourteen years, another census was taken, and the number is given as only 36,359, showing a decrease of 32.29%. Mr. Fenton, after showing in detail the insufficiency of the various causes, usually assigned in explanation of this extraordinary decrease, such as new diseases, flagellacy of the movement, drunkenness, wars, etc., concludes on weighty grounds that it depends chiefly on the unproductiveness of the woman and on the extraordinary mortality of the young children. In proof of this he shows that in 1844 there was one non-adult for every 2.57 adults, whereas in 1858 there was only one non-adult for every 3.27 adults. The mortality of the adults is also great. He adduces as a further cause of the decrease the inequality of the sexes, for fewer females are born than males. To this latter point, depending perhaps on a widely distinct cause, I shall return in a future chapter. Mr. Fenton contrasts with astonishment the decrease in New Zealand with the increase in Ireland, countries not very dissimilar in climate, and where the inhabitants now follow nearly similar habits. The Maoris themselves attribute their decadence, in some measure, to the introduction of new food and clothing, and the attendant change of habits. And it will be seen, when we consider the influence of changed conditions on fertility, that they are probably right. The diminution began between the years of 1830 and 1840, and Mr. Fenton shows that about 1830 the art of manufacturing putrid corn, maize, by long steeping in water was discovered and largely practiced, and this proves that the change of habits was beginning amongst the natives, even when New Zealand was only thinly inhabited by Europeans. When I visited the Bay of Islands in 1835, the dress and food of the inhabitants had already been much modified. They raised potatoes, maize, and other agricultural produce, and exchanged them for English manufactured goods and tobacco. End of section 18、of man, part one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley. The Descent of Man, part one, by Charles Darwin, chapter seven, on the races of man. Part three. It is evident from many statements in the life of Bishop Patterson that the Melanesians of the New Hebrides and neighboring archipelagos suffered to an extraordinary degree in health and perished in large numbers when they were removed to New Zealand, Norfolk Island, and other salubrious places in order to be educated as missionaries. The decrease of the native population of the Sandwich Islands is as notorious as that of New Zealand. It has been roughly estimated by those best capable of judging that when Cook discovered the islands in 1779, 
the population amounted to about three hundred thousand according to a loose census in 1823 the numbers then were one hundred and forty two thousand fifty in eighteen thirty two and at several subsequent periods an accurate census was officially taken but i have been able to obtain only the following returns year native population except during eighteen thirty two and eighteen thirty six when the few foreigners in the islands were included annual rate of decrease per cent assuming it to have been uniform between the successive censuses these censuses being taken at irregular intervals 1832 130,313 4.46% 4 1836 108,579 2.47% 2 1853 71,019 81 hundredths of a percent 1860 67,000 84 2.18% 1866 58,765 2.17% 1872 51,531 no percent given we here see that in the interval of forty years between eighteen thirty two and eighteen seventy two the population has decreased no less than sixty eight per cent this has been attributed by most writers to the profligacy of the women to former bloody wars and to the severe labor imposed on conquered tribes and to newly introduced diseases which have been on several occasions extremely destructive no doubt these and other such causes have been highly efficient and may account for the extraordinary rate of decrease between the years eighteen thirty two and eighteen thirty six but the most potent of all the causes seems to be lessened fertility according to dr ruschenberger of the u s navy who visited these islands between 1835 and 1837. In one district of Hawaii, only 25 men out of 1,134, and in another district, only 10 out of 637, had a family with as many as three children. Of 80 married women, only 39 had ever born children, and, quote, the official report gives an average of half a child to each married couple on the whole island, end quote. This is almost exactly the same average as with the Tasmanians at Oyster Cove. Jarvis, who published his history in 1843, says that, quote, Families who have three children are freed from all taxes. Those having more are rewarded by gifts of land and other encouragements, end quote this unparalleled enactment by the government well shews how infertile the race had become the rev a bishop stated in the hawaiian spectator in eighteen thirty nine that a large proportion of the children die at early ages and bishop staley informs me that this is still the case just as in new zealand this has been attributed to the neglect of the children by the women, but is probably in large part due to innate weakness of constitution in the children in relation to the lessened fertility of their parents. There is, moreover, a further resemblance to the case of New Zealand in the fact that there is a large excess of male over female births. The census of 1872 gives 31,650 males to 25,247 females of all ages. That is 125.36 males for every 100 females. Whereas in all civilized countries, 
the females exceed the males. No doubt the profligacy of the women may in part account for their small fertility, but their changed habits of life is a much more probable cause, and which will at the same time account for the increased mortality, especially of the children. The islands were visited by Cook in 1779, Vancouver in 1794, and often subsequently by whalers. In 1819, missionaries arrived and found that idolatry had been already abolished and other changes effected by the king. After this period, there was a rapid change in almost all the habits of life of the natives, and they soon became, quote, the most civilized of the Pacific Islanders, end quote. One of my informants, Mr. Cohen, who was born on the islands, remarks that the natives have undergone a greater change in their habits of life in the course of fifty years than Englishmen during a thousand years. From information received from Bishop Staley, it does not appear that the poor classes have ever much changed their diet, although many new kinds of fruit have been introduced, and the sugar cane is in universal use. Owing, however, to their passion for imitating Europeans, they altered their manner of dressing at an early period, and the use of alcoholic drinks became very general. Although these changes appear inconsiderable, I can well believe, from what is known with respect to animals, that they might suffice to lessen the fertility of the natives. Lastly, Mr. McNamara states that the low and degraded inhabitants of the Andaman Islands, on the eastern side of the Gulf of Bengal, are, quote, eminently susceptible to any change of climate. In fact, take them away from their island homes, and they are almost certain to die, and that independently of diet or extraneous influences. End quote. He further states that the inhabitants of the valley of Nepal, which is extremely hot in summer, and also the various hill tribes of India, suffer from dysentery and fever when on the plains, and they die if they attempt to pass the whole year there. We thus see that many of the wilder races of man are apt to suffer much in health when subjected to changed conditions or habits of life and not exclusively from being transported to a new climate. Mere alterations in habits, which do not appear injurious in themselves, seem to have this same effect, and in several cases the children are particularly liable to suffer. It has often been said, as Mr. McNamara remarks, that man can resist with impunity the greatest diversities of climate and other changes, but this is true only of the civilized races. Man in his wild condition seems to be in this respect almost as susceptible as his nearest allies, the anthropoid apes, which have never yet survived long when removed from their native country. Lessened fertility from changed conditions, as in the case of the Tasmanians, Maoris, Sandwich Islanders, and apparently the Australians, is still more interesting than their liability to ill health and death, for even a slight degree of infertility combined with those other causes which tend to check the increase of every population would sooner or later lead to extinction. The diminution of fertility may be explained in some cases by the profligacy of the women, as until lately with the Tahitians, but Mr. Fenton has shewn that this explanation by no means suffices with the New Zealanders, nor does it with the Tasmanians. In the paper above quoted, Mr. McNamara gives reasons for believing that the inhabitants of districts subject to malaria are apt to be sterile, but this cannot apply in several of the above cases. Some writers have suggested that the aborigines of islands have suffered infertility and health from long-continued interbreeding, but in the above cases, infertility has coincided too closely 
with the arrival of Europeans for us to admit this explanation. Nor have we at present any reason to believe that man is highly sensitive to the evil effects of interbreeding, especially in areas so large as New Zealand and the Sandwich Archipelago with its diversified stations. On the contrary, it is known that the present inhabitants of Norfolk Island are nearly all cousins or near relations, as are the Todas in India and the inhabitants of some of the western islands of Scotland, and yet they seem not to have suffered infertility. A much more probable view is suggested by the analogy of the lower animals. The reproductive system can be shown to be susceptible to an extraordinary degree, though why we know not, to changed conditions of life, and this susceptibility leads both to beneficial and to evil results. A large collection of facts on this subject is given in Chapter 18 of Volume 2 of my Variation of Animals and Plants Under Domestication. I can here give only the briefest abstract, and every one interested in the subject may consult the above work. Very slight changes increase the health, vigor, and fertility of most or all organic beings, whilst other changes are known to render a large number of animals sterile. One of the most familiar cases is that of tamed elephants not breeding in India. Though they often breed in Ava, where the females are allowed to roam about the forest to some extent and are thus placed under more natural conditions. The case of various American monkeys, both sexes of which have been kept for many years together in their own countries, and yet have very rarely or never bred, is a more apposite instance. Because of their relationship to man, it is remarkable how slight a change in the conditions often induces sterility in a wild animal when captured, and this is the more strange as all our domestic animals have become more fertile than they were in a state of nature, and some of them can resist the most unnatural conditions with undiminished fertility. Certain groups of animals are much more liable than others to be affected by captivity, and generally all the species of the same group are affected in the same manner. But sometimes a single species in a group is rendered sterile, whilst the others are not so. On the other hand, a single species may retain its fertility whilst most of the others fail to breed. The males and females of some species, when confined, or when allowed to live almost but not quite free in their native country, never unite. Others, thus circumstanced, frequently unite but never produce offspring. Others, again, produce some offspring but fewer than in a state of nature, and as bearing on the above cases of man, it is important to remark that the young are apt to be weak and sickly or malformed and to perish at an early age. Seeing how general is this law of the susceptibility of the reproductive system to change conditions of life, and that it holds good with our nearest allies, the quadrumana, I can hardly doubt that it applies to man in his primeval state. Hence, if savages of any race are induced suddenly to change their habits of life, they become more or less sterile, and their young offspring suffer in health, in the same manner and from the same cause as do the elephant and hunting leopard in India, many monkeys in America, and a host of animals of all kinds on removal from their natural conditions. We can see why it is that Aborigines, who have long inhabited islands, and who must have been long exposed to nearly uniform conditions, 
should be specially affected by any change in their habits, as seems to be the case. Civilized races can certainly resist changes of all kinds far better than savages, and in this respect they resemble domesticated animals, for though the latter sometimes suffer in health, for instance European dogs in India, yet they are rarely rendered sterile, though a few such instances have been recorded. The immunity of civilized races and domesticated animals is probably due to their having been subjected to a greater extent, and therefore having grown somewhat more accustomed to diversified or varying conditions than the majority of wild animals, and to their having formerly immigrated or been carried from country to country, and to different families or sub-races having intercrossed. It appears that a cross with civilized races at once gives to an aboriginal race an immunity from the evil consequences of changed conditions. Thus, the crossed offspring from the Tahitians and English, when settled in Pitcairn Island, increased so rapidly that the island was soon overstocked, and in June 1856 they were removed to Norfolk Island. They then consisted of sixty married persons and a hundred and thirty four children, making a total of a hundred and ninety four. Here they likewise increased so rapidly that although sixteen of them returned to Pitcairn Island in eighteen fifty nine, they numbered in January eighteen sixty eight three hundred souls, the males and females being in exactly equal numbers. What a contrast does this case present with that of the Tasmanians? The Norfolk Islanders increased in only twelve and a half years from 194 to 300, whereas the Tasmanians decreased during 15 years from 120 to 46, of which latter number only 10 were children. So again, in the interval between the census of 1866 in 1872, the natives of full blood in the Sandwich Islands decreased by 8,081, whilst the half-castes, who are believed to be healthier, increased by 847. But I do not know whether the latter number includes the offspring from the half-castes, or only the half-castes of the first generation. The cases which I have here given all relate to aborigines, who have been subjected to new conditions as the result of the immigration of civilized men. But sterility and ill health would probably follow if savages were compelled by any cause, such as the inroad of a conquering tribe, to desert their homes and to change their habits. It is an interesting circumstance that the chief check to wild animals becoming domesticated, which implies the power of their breeding freely when first captured, and one chief check to wild men when brought into contact with civilization, surviving to form a civilized race, is the same, namely sterility from changed conditions of life. Finally, Although the gradual decrease and ultimate extinction of the races of man is a highly complex problem, depending on many causes which differ in different places and at different times, it is the same problem as that presented by the extinction of one of the higher animals, of the fossil horse, for instance, which disappeared from South America, soon afterwards to be replaced within the same districts, by countless troops of the Spanish horse. The New Zealander seems conscious of this parallelism, for he compares his future fate with that of the native rat, now almost exterminated by the European rat. Though the difficulty is great to our imagination, and really great if we wish to ascertain the precise causes and their manner of action. 
it ought not to be so to our reason as long as we keep steadily in mind that the increase of each species and each race is constantly checked in various ways so that if any new check even a slight one be superadded the race will surely decrease in number and decreasing numbers will sooner or later lead to extinction the end in most cases being promptly determined by the inroads of conquering tribes on the formation of the races of man in some cases the crossing of distinct races has led to the formation of a new race the singular fact that the europeans and hindus who belong to the same aryan stock and speak a language fundamentally the same differ widely in appearance whilst europeans differ but little from jews who belong to the semitic stock and speak quite another language has been accounted for by brokaw through certain Aryan branches having been largely crossed by indigenous tribes during their wide diffusion. When two races in close contact cross, the first result is a heterogeneous mixture. Thus, Mr. Hunter, in describing the Santali or hill tribes of India, says that hundreds of imperceptible gradations may be traced, quote, from the black squat tribes of the mountains to the tall olive-colored brahmin with his intellectual brow calm eyes and high but narrow head end quote, so that it is necessary in courts of justice to ask the witnesses whether they are santalis or hindus whether a heterogeneous people such as the inhabitants of some of the polynesian islands formed by the crossing of two distinct races with few or no pure members left would ever become homogeneous is not known from direct evidence but as with our domesticated animals a crossbreed can certainly be fixed and made uniform by careful selection in the course of a few generations the Variation of Animals and Plants Under Domestication, Volume 2, page 95. We may infer that the free intercrossing of a heterogeneous mixture during a long descent would supply the place of selection and overcome any tendency to reversion so that the cross race would ultimately become homogeneous, though it might not partake in an equal degree of the characters of the two parent races of all the differences between the races of man the color of the skin is the most conspicuous and one of the best marked it is formerly thought that differences of this kind could be accounted for by long exposure to different climates but pallas first shewed that this is not tenable and he has since been followed by almost all anthropologists this view has been rejected chiefly because the distribution of the various colored races most of whom must have long inhabited their present homes does not coincide with corresponding differences of climate some little weight may be given to such cases as that of the dutch families who as we hear on excellent authority have not undergone the least change of color after residing for three centuries in south africa an argument on the same side may likewise be drawn from the uniform appearance in various parts of the world of gypsies and jews though the uniformity of the latter has been somewhat exaggerated a very damp or a very dry atmosphere has been supposed to be more influential in modifying the color of the skin than mere heat but as de orbigny in south america and livingstone in africa arrived at diametrically opposite conclusions with respect to dampness and dryness 
any conclusion on this head must be considered as very doubtful. Various facts which I have given elsewhere prove that the color of the skin and hair is sometimes correlated in a surprising manner with a complete immunity from the action of certain vegetable poisons and from the attacks of certain parasites. Hence it occurred to me that Negroes and other dark races might have acquired their dark tints by the darker individuals escaping from the deadly influence of the miasma of their native countries during a long series of generations. I afterwards found that this same idea had long ago occurred to Dr. Wells. It has long been known that Negroes and even mulattoes are almost completely exempt from the yellow fever, so destructive in tropical America. They likewise escape to a large extent the fatal intermittent fevers that prevail along at least 2,600 miles of the shores of Africa, and which annually cause one-fifth of the white settlers to die, and another fifth to return home invalided. This immunity in the Negro seems to be partly inherent, depending on some unknown peculiarity of constitution and partly the result of acclimatization. Boucher states that the Negro regiments recruited near the Sudan and borrowed from the Viceroy of Egypt for the Mexican War escaped the yellow fever almost equally with the Negroes originally brought from various parts of Africa and accustomed to the climate of the West Indies. That acclimatization plays a part is shewn by the many cases in which Negroes have become somewhat liable to tropical fevers after having resided for some time in a colder climate. The nature of the climate under which the white races have long resided likewise has some influence on them, for during the fearful epidemic of yellow fever in Demerara during 1837, Dr. Blair found that the death rate of the immigrants was proportional to the latitude of the country whence they had come. With the Negro, the immunity, as far as it is the result of acclimatization, implies exposure during a prodigious length of time. For the aborigines of tropical America, who have resided there from time immemorial, are not exempt from yellow fever, and the Rev. H. B. Tristram states that there are districts in northern Africa which the native inhabitants are compelled annually to leave, though the Negroes can remain with safety. That the immunity of the Negro is in any degree correlated with the color of his skin is a mere conjecture. It may be correlated with some difference in his blood, nervous system, or other tissues. Nevertheless, from the facts above alluded to and from some connection apparently existing between complexion and a tendency to consumption, the conjecture seemed to me not improbable. Consequently, I endeavored, with but little success, in the spring of 1862 I obtained permission from the Director General of the Medical Department of the Army to transmit to the surgeons of the various regiments on foreign service a blank table with the following appended remarks, but I have received no returns. Quote, As several well-marked cases have been recorded with our domestic animals of a relation between the color of the dermal appendages and the constitution, and it being notorious that there is some limited degree of relation between the color of the races of man and the climate inhabited by them, the following investigation seems worth consideration, namely, whether there is any relation in Europeans between the color of their hair and their liability to the diseases of tropical countries. If the surgeons of the several regiments, when stationed in unhealthy tropical districts, would be so good as first to count as a standard of comparison, how many men in the force whence the sick are drawn have dark and light colored hair and hair of intermediate or doubtful tints, 
and if a similar account were kept by the same medical gentleman of all the men who suffered from malarious and yellow fevers or from dysentery it would soon be apparent after some thousand cases have been tabulated whether there exists any relation between the color of the hair and constitutional liability to tropical diseases perhaps no such relation would be discovered but the investigation is well worth making in case any positive result were obtained it might be of some practical use in selecting men for any particular service theoretically the result would be of high interest as indicating one means by which a race of men inhabiting from a remote period an unhealthy tropical climate might have become dark colored by the better preservation of dark haired or dark complexioned individuals during a long succession of generations end quote, to ascertain how far it holds good the late dr daniel who had long lived on the west coast of africa told me that he did not believe in any such relation he was himself unusually fair and had withstood the climate in a wonderful manner when he first arrived as a boy on the coast an old and experienced negro chief predicted from his appearance that this would prove the case dr nicholson of antigua after having attended to this subject writes to me that dark-colored europeans escape the yellow fever more than those that are light-colored mr j m harris altogether denies that europeans with dark hair withstand a hot climate better than other men on the contrary experience has taught him in making a selection of men for service on the coast of africa to choose those with red hair Quote, that it has been noticed by some medical officers that europeans with light hair and florid complexions suffer less from diseases of tropical countries than persons with dark hair and sallow complexions and so far as i know there appear to be good grounds for this remark End quote. on the other hand mr heddle of sierra leone quote, who has had more clerks killed under him than any other man end quote, by the climate of the west african coast holds a directly opposite view as does captain burton as far therefore as these slight indications go there seems no foundation for the hypothesis that blackness has resulted from the darker and darker individuals having survived better during long exposure to fever generating miasma dr sharp remarks that a tropical sun which burns and blisters a white skin does not injure a black one at all and as he adds this is not due to habit in the individual for children only six or eight months old are often carried about naked and are not affected i have been assured by a medical man that some years ago during each summer but not during the winter his hands became marked with light brown patches like although larger than freckles and that these patches were never affected by sunburning whilst the white parts of his skin have on several occasions been much inflamed and blistered with the lower animals there is also a constitutional difference in liability to the action of the sun between those parts of the skin clothed with white hair and other parts whether the saving of the skin from being thus burnt is of sufficient importance to account for a dark tint having been gradually acquired by man through natural selection i am unable to judge if it be so we should have to assume that the natives of tropical america have lived there for a much shorter time than the negroes in africa or the papuans in the southern parts of the malay archipelago just as the lighter colored hindus have resided in india for a shorter time than the darker aborigines of the central and southern parts of the peninsula although with our present knowledge we cannot account for the differences of color in the races of man 
through any advantage thus gained, or from the direct action of climate. Yet we must not quite ignore the latter agency, for there is good reason to believe that some inherited effect is thus produced. Dr. Raleigh states on the authority of Konikoff that the greater number of German families settled in Georgia have acquired in the course of two generations dark hair and eyes. Mr. D. Forbes informs me that the Quechuas in the Andes vary greatly in color according to the position of the valleys inhabited by them. We have seen in the second chapter that the conditions of life affect the development of the bodily frame in a direct manner, and that the effects are transmitted. Thus, as is generally admitted, the European settlers in the United States undergo a slight but extraordinary rapid change of appearance. Their bodies and limbs become elongated, and I hear from Colonel Bernis that during the late war in the United States, good evidence was afforded of this fact by the ridiculous appearance presented by the German regiments when dressed in ready-made clothes manufactured for the American market and which were much too long for the men in every way. There is also a considerable body of evidence showing that in the southern states the house slaves of the third generation present a markedly different appearance from the field slaves. If, however, we look to the races of man as distributed over the world, we must infer that their characteristic differences cannot be accounted for by the direct action of different conditions of life, even after exposure to them for an enormous period of time. The Eskimos live exclusively on animal food. They are clothed in thick fur and are exposed to intense cold and to prolonged darkness yet they do not differ in any extreme degree from the inhabitants of southern China, who live entirely on vegetable food and are exposed almost naked to a hot, glaring climate. The unclothed Fuegians live on the marine productions of their inhospitable shores. The Botocudos of Brazil wander around the hot forests of the interior and live chiefly on vegetable productions, yet these tribes resemble each other so closely that the Fuegians on board the Beagle were mistaken by some Brazilians for Botocudos. The Botocudos again, as well as the other inhabitants of tropical America, are wholly different from the Negroes who inhabit the opposite shores of the Atlantic, are exposed to a nearly similar climate and follow nearly the same habits of life. Nor can the differences between the races of man be accounted for by the inherited effects of the increased or decreased use of parts, except to a quite insignificant degree. Men who habitually live in canoes may have their legs somewhat stunted. Those who inhabit lofty regions may have their chests enlarged and those who constantly use certain sense organs may have the cavities in which they are lodged somewhat increased in size, and their features consequently a little modified. With civilized nations, the reduced size of the jaws from lessened use, the habitual play of different muscles serving to express different emotions, and the increased size of the brain from greater intellectual activity, have together produced a considerable effect on their general appearance when compared with savages. Increased bodily stature, without any corresponding increase in the size of the brain, may, judging from the previously adduced case of rabbits, have given to some races an elongated skull of the dolichocephalic type. Lastly, the little understood principle of correlated development has sometimes come into action as in the case of great muscular development and strongly projecting supraorbital ridges. The color of the skin and hair are plainly correlated, as is the texture of the hair, with its color, in the Mandans of North America. 
Mr. Catlin states that in the whole tribe of the Mandans, about one in ten or twelve of the members, of all ages and both sexes, have bright silvery gray hair, which is hereditary. Now this hair is as coarse and harsh as that of a horse's mane, whilst the hair of other colors is fine and soft. The color also of the skin and the odor emitted by it are likewise in some manner connected. With the breeds of sheep, the number of hairs within a given space and the number of excretory pores are related. If we may judge from the analogy of our domesticated animals, many modifications of structure in man probably come under this principle of correlated development. End of section 19. Recording by Bill Mosley, Frelsberg, Texas. U.S.A. Section 20 of The Descent of Man, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joseph Lawler. The Descent of Man, Part 1, by Charles Darwin. Chapter 7, On the Races of Man, Part 4. We have now seen that the external characteristic differences between the races of man cannot be accounted for in a satisfactory manner by the direct action of the conditions of life, nor by the effects of the continued use of parts, nor through the principle of correlation. We are, therefore, led to inquire whether slight individual differences, to which man is eminently liable, may not have been preserved and augmented through a long series of generations through natural selection. But here we are at once met by the objection that beneficial variations alone can thus be preserved, and, as far as we are enabled to judge, although always liable to err on this head, None of the differences between the races of man are of any direct or special service to him. The intellectual and moral or social faculties must, of course, be accepted from this remark. The great variability of all the external differences between the races of man likewise indicates that they cannot be of much importance. For, if important, they would long ago have been either fixed and preserved or eliminated. In this respect, man resembles those forms called by naturalists protean or polymorphic, which have remained extremely variable, owing, as it seems, to such variations being of an indifferent nature, and to their having thus escaped the action of natural selection. We have thus far been baffled in all our attempts to account for the differences between the races of man, but there remains one important agency namely sexual selection, which appears to have acted powerfully on man, as on many other animals. I do not intend to assert that sexual selection will account for all the differences between the races. An unexplained residuum is left, about which we can only say, in our ignorance, that as individuals are continually born with, for instance, heads a little rounder or narrower, and with noses a little longer or shorter, such slight differences might become fixed and uniform if the unknown agencies which induce them were to act in a more constant manner, aided by long-continued intercrossing. Such variations come under the provisional class, alluded to in our second chapter, which, for want of a better term, are often called spontaneous. Nor do I pretend that the effects of sexual selection can be indicated with scientific precision, but it can be shown that it would be an inexplicable fact if man had not been modified by this agency, which appears to have acted powerfully on innumerable animals. It can further be shown that the differences between the races of man, as in color, hairiness, form of features, etc., are of a kind which might have been expected to come under the influence of sexual selection. But in order to treat this subject properly, I have found it necessary to pass the whole animal kingdom in review. I have therefore devoted to it the second part of this work. 
At the close I shall return to man and, after attempting to show how far he has been modified through sexual selection, will give a brief summary of the chapters in the first part. Note on the resemblances and differences in the structure and development of the brain in man and apes by Professor Huxley, FRS. The controversy respecting the nature and the extent of the differences in the structure of the brain in man and apes, which arose some 15 years ago, has not yet come to an end, though the subject matter of the dispute is, at present, totally different from what it was formerly. It was originally asserted and reasserted with singular pertinacity that the brain of all the apes, even the highest, differs from that of man in the absence of such conspicuous structures as the posterior lobes of the cerebral hemispheres, with the posterior cornu of the lateral ventricle and the hippocampus minor, contained in those lobes, which are so obvious in man. But the truth is that the three structures in question are as well developed in apes as in human brains, or even better, and that it is characteristic of the primates, if we exclude the lemurs, to have these parts well developed stands at present on as secure a basis as any proposition in comparative anatomy. Moreover, it is admitted by every one of the long series of anatomists who, of late years, have paid special attention to the arrangement of the complicated sulci and gyri which appear upon the surface of the cerebral hemispheres in man and the higher apes, that they are disposed after the very same pattern in him as in them. Every principal gyrus and sulcus of a chimpanzee's brain is clearly represented in that of man, so that the terminology which applies to the one answers for the other. On this point, there is no difference of opinion. Some years since, Professor Bischoff published a memoir on the cerebral convolutions of man and apes. And, as the purpose of my learned colleague was certainly not to diminish the value of the differences between apes and men in this respect, I am glad to make a citation from him. Quote, That the apes, and especially the orang, chimpanzee, and gorilla, come very close to man in their organization, much nearer than to any other animal, is a well-known fact disputed by nobody. Looking at the matter from the point of view of organization alone, no one probably would ever have disputed the view of Linnaeus, that man should be placed, merely as a peculiar species, at the head of the mammalia, and of those apes. Both show, in all their organs, so close an affinity that the most exact anatomical investigation is needed in order to demonstrate those differences which really exist. So it is with the brains. The brains of man, the orang, the chimpanzee, the gorilla, in spite of all the important differences which they present, come very close to one another." Unquote. There remains, then, no dispute as to the resemblance and fundamental characters between the ape's brain and man's, nor any as to the wonderfully close similarity between the chimpanzee, orang, and man in even the details of the arrangement of the gyri and sulci of the cerebral hemispheres, nor, turning to the differences between the brains of the highest apes and that of man, is there any serious question as to the nature and extent of these differences? It is admitted that the man's cerebral hemispheres are absolutely and relatively larger than those of the orang and chimpanzee, that his frontal lobes are less excavated by the upward protrusion of the roof of the orbits, that his gyri and sulci are, as a rule, less symmetrically disposed, and present a greater number of secondary plications. And it is admitted that, as a rule, in man, the temporo-occipital or external perpendicular fissure, which is usually so strongly marked a feature of the ape's brain, is but faintly marked. But it is also clear that none of these differences constitutes a sharp demarcation between the man's and the ape's brain. In respect to the external perpendicular fissure of Graciolet, in the human brain, for instance, Professor Turner remarks, quote, 
In some brains it appears simply as an indentation of the margin of the hemisphere, but in others it extends for some distance more or less transversely outwards. I saw it in the right hemisphere of a female brain pass more than two inches outwards, and on another specimen, also the right hemisphere, it proceeded for four-tenths of an inch outwards, and then extended downwards as far as the lower margin of the outer surface of the hemisphere. The imperfect definition of this fissure in the majority of human brains, as compared with its remarkable distinctness in the brain of most quadrumana, is owing to the presence in the former of certain superficial, well-marked, secondary convolutions which bridge it over and connect the parietal with the occipital lobe. The closer the first of these bridging gyri lies to the longitudinal fissure, the shorter is the external parieto-occipital fissure." Unquote. The obliteration of the external perpendicular fissure of Graciolet, therefore, is not a constant character of the human brain. On the other hand, its full development is not a constant character of the higher ape's brain. For, in the chimpanzee, the more or less extensive obliteration of the external perpendicular sulcus by bridging convolutions, on one side or the other, has been noted over and over again by Professor Ralston, Mr. Marshall, M. Broca, and Professor Turner. At the conclusion of a special paper on this subject, the latter writes, quote, the three specimens of the brain of a chimpanzee just described prove that the generalization which Graciolet has attempted to draw of the complete absence of the first connecting convolution and the concealment of the second as essentially characteristic features in the brain of this animal is by no means universally applicable. In only one specimen did the brain in these particulars follow the law which Graciolet has expressed. As regards the presence of the superior bridging convolution, I am inclined to think that it has existed in one hemisphere, at least, in a majority of the brains of this animal which have, up to this time, been figured or described. The superficial position of the second bridging convolution is evidently less frequent, and has, as yet, I believe, only been seen in the brain A recorded in this communication. The asymmetrical arrangement in the convolutions of the two hemispheres, which previous observers have referred to in their descriptions, is also well illustrated in these specimens. Unquote. Even were the presence of the temporo-occipital or external perpendicular sulcus a mark of distinction between the higher apes and man, the value of such a distinctive character would be rendered very doubtful by the structure of the brain in the platyrrhine apes. In fact, while the temporo-occipital is one of the most constant of sulci in a catarrhine or old-world apes, it is never very strongly developed in the new-world apes. It is absent in the smaller platyrrhini, rudimentary in pathetia, and more or less obliterated by bridging convolutions in otoles. A character which is thus variable within the limits of a single group can have no great taxonomic value. It is further established that the degree of asymmetry of the convolution of the two sides in the human brain is subject to much individual variation, and that, in those individuals of the Bushman race who have been examined, the gyri and sulci of the two hemispheres are considerably less complicated and more symmetrical than in the European brain, while in some individuals of the chimpanzee, their complexity and asymmetry become notable. This is particularly the case in the brain of a young male chimpanzee figured by Monsieur Broca. Again, as respects the question of absolute size, it is established that the difference between the largest and the smallest healthy human brain is greater than the difference between the smallest healthy human brain and the largest chimpanzee's or orang's brain. Moreover, there is one circumstance in which the orangs and chimpanzees' brains resemble man's, but in which they differ from the lower apes, and that is the presence of two corpora candicantia, the cinnamorpha having but one. In view of these facts, 
I do not hesitate in this year, 1874, to repeat and insist upon the proposition which I enunciated in 1863. Quote, so far as cerebral structure goes, therefore, it is clear that man differs less from the chimpanzee or the orang than these do even from the monkeys, and that the difference between the brain of the chimpanzee and of man is almost insignificant when compared with that between the chimpanzee brain and that of a lemur. Unquote. In the paper to which I have referred, Professor Bischoff does not deny the second part of this statement, but he first makes the irrelevant remark that it is not wonderful if the brains of an orang and a lemur are very different, and secondly goes on to assert that, quote, if we successively compare the brain of a man with that of an orang, the brain of this with that of a chimpanzee, of this with that of a gorilla, and so on of a hylobates, semnopithecus, cynocephalus, cercopithecus, macacus, cebus, calithrix, lemur, stenops, hopulae, we shall not meet with a greater or even as great a break in the degree of development of the convolutions as we find between the brain of a man and that of an orang or chimpanzee." Unquote. To which I reply, firstly, that whether this assertion be true or false, it has nothing whatever to do with the proposition enunciated in Man's Place in Nature, which refers not to the development of the convolutions alone, but to the structure of the whole brain. If Professor Bischoff had taken the trouble to refer to page 96 of the work he criticizes, in fact, he would have found the following passage. Quote, and it is a remarkable circumstance that though, so far as our present knowledge extends, there is one true structural break in the series of forms of simian brains. This hiatus does not lie between man and the man-like apes, but between the lower and the lowest simians, or, in other words, between the old and new world apes and monkeys and the lemurs. Every lemur, which has yet been examined, in fact, has its cerebellum partially visible from above, and its posterior lobe with a contained posterior cornu and hippocampus minor more or less rudimentary. Every marmoset, American monkey, old world monkey, baboon, or man-like ape, on the contrary, has its cerebellum entirely hidden, posteriorly, by the cerebral lobes, and possesses a large posterior cornu with a well-developed hippocampus minor." Unquote. This statement was a strictly accurate account of what was known when it was made, and it does not appear to me to be more than apparently weakened by the subsequent discovery of the relatively small development of the posterior lobes in the siamang and in the howling monkey. Notwithstanding the exceptional brevity of the posterior lobes in these two species, no one will pretend that their brains, in the slightest degree, approach those of the lemurs. And if, instead of putting Hopole out of its natural place, as Professor Bischoff most unaccountably does, we write the series of animals he has chosen to mention as follows. Homo, Pathicus, Troglodytes, Hylobates, Semnopithecus, Cynocephalus, Cercopithecus, Macacus, Cebus, Calithrix, Hapile, Lemur, Stenops. I venture to reaffirm that the great break in this series lies between Hapile and Lemur, and that this break is considerably greater than that between any other two terms of that series. Professor Bischoff ignores the fact that long before he wrote, Graciolet had suggested the separation of the lemurs from the other primates on the very ground of the difference in their cerebral characters, and that Professor Flower had made the following observations in the course of his description of the brain of the Javan loris. Quote, and it is especially remarkable that, in the development of the posterior lobes, there is no approximation to the lemurine short-hemisphered brain, 
in those monkeys which are commonly supposed to approach this family in other respects, viz. the lower members of the platyrrhine group. Unquote. So far as the structure of the adult brain is concerned, then, the very considerable additions to our knowledge which have been made by the researches of so many investigators during the past ten years fully justify the statement which I made in 1863. But it has been said that admitting the similarity between the adult brains of man and apes, they are nevertheless, in reality, widely different because they exhibit fundamental differences in the mode of their development. No one would be more ready than I to admit the force of this argument if such fundamental differences of development really exist. But I deny that they do exist. On the contrary, there is a fundamental agreement in the development of the brain in men and apes. Graciolet originated the statement that there is a fundamental difference in the development of the brains of apes and that of man, consisting in this, that in the apes, the sulci which first make their appearance are situated on the posterior region of the cerebral hemispheres, while in the human fetus, the sulci first become visible on the frontal lobes. Footnote. Quote, Chitou les sages, les plis postérieurs se développent, les premiers, les plis antérieurs se développent plus tard. Aussi, la vertebra occipitale et la paritale sont-elles relativement très grandes chez le fœtus? L'homme présente une exception remarquable quant à l'époque de l'apparition des plis frontaux qui sont les premiers indiques. Mais le développement général de l'herbe frontal envisage ses éléments par rapport à son volume suit les mêmes lois que dans les sages. Unquote. End of footnote. This general statement is based upon two observations, the one of a gibbon almost ready to be born, in which the posterior gyri were well developed, while those of the frontal lobes were hardly indicated. Footnote. Graciolet's words are, quote, Dans les fœtus dont il s'agit, les plis cérébraux postérieurs sont bien développés, sans dire que les plis du lobe frontal sont à peine antiques. Unquote. The figure, however, shows the fissure of Rolando and one of the frontal sulci plainly enough. Nevertheless, M. Alix, in his Notice sur les travaux anthropologiques de Graciolet, writes thus, quote, Graciolet a eu entre les mots le cerveau de Fétus de Gibon sage éminemment supérieur et tellement rapproché de Laurent que des naturalistes très compétents l'orange parmi les anthropoïdes. Monsieur Huxley, par exemple, n'hésite pas sur ses points. Eh bien, c'est sur le cerveau d'Aphetus des gibbons que Graciolet avoue les circonvolutions ou l'aube temporo sphénoïdal déjà développe lorsqu'il n'existe pas encore de pli sur le lobe frontal. Il est donc via entarisé à dire que chez l'homme les circonvolutions apparaissent de en W 
tandis que chez les singes, elle se développe de W O A. Unquote. End of footnote. And the other of a human fetus at the 22nd or 23rd week of utero gestation, in which Graciolet notes that the insula was uncovered, but that nevertheless, quote, Dès onze jours, c'est de l'aube antérieure, un séjour peu profond antique, la séparation du l'aube occipital, très réduit du lieu de cette époque. Le reste de la surface cérébrale est encore absolument lisse. Unquote. Three views of this brain are given in Plate 2, figures 1, 2, 3 of the work cited, showing the upper, lateral, and inferior views of the hemispheres, but not the inner view. It is worthy of note that the figure by no means bears out Graciolet's description, inasmuch as the fissure, enterotemporal on the posterior half of the face of the hemisphere, is more marked than any of those vaguely indicated in the anterior half. If the figure is correct, it in no way justifies Graciolet's conclusion, quote, Il y a donc entre ses cerveaux, those of a calithrix and of a gibbon, es ul oui du fetus uma on différence Fondamentale. She's celle où c'est longtemps avant que le pli temporo apparaisse les plis fronteux essaie d'exister. Since Graciolet's time, however, the development of the gyri and sulci of the brain has been made the subject of renewed investigation by Schmidt. Bischoff, Pansch, and more particularly Ecker, whose work is not only the latest, but by far the most complete memoir on the subject. The final results of their inquiries may be summed up as follows. 1. In the human fetus, the sylvian fissure is formed in the course of the third month of utero gestation. In this and the fourth month, the cerebral hemispheres are smooth and rounded, with the exception of the sylvian depression, and they project backwards far beyond the cerebellum. 2. The sulci, properly so called, begin to appear in the interval between the end of the fourth and the beginning of the sixth month of fetal life. But Ecker is careful to point out that not only the time but the order of their appearance is subject to considerable individual variation. In no case, however, are either the frontal or the temporal sulci the earliest. The first which appears, in fact, lies on the inner face of the hemisphere, whence doubtless Graciolet, who does not seem to have examined that face in his fetus, overlooked it, and is either the internal perpendicular occipital parietal or the calcarine sulcus, these two being close together and eventually running into one another. As a rule, the occipito parietal is the earlier of the two. 3. At the latter part of this period, another sulcus, the posterior parietal, or fissure of Rolando, is developed, and it is followed, in the course of the sixth month, by the other principal sulci of the frontal parietal, temporal, and occipital lobes. There is, however, no clear evidence that one of these constantly appears before the other, and it is remarkable that, in the brain at the period described and figured by Ecker, the anterotemporal sulcus, seizure parallèle, so characteristic of the ape's brain, is as well, if not better developed than the fissure of Rolando, and is much more marked than the proper frontal sulci. Taking the facts as they now stand, 
it appears to me that the order of the appearance of the sulci and gyri of the fetal human brain is in perfect harmony with the general doctrine of evolution and with the view that man has been evolved from some ape-like form though there can be no doubt that form was in many respects different from any member of the primates now living von baer taught us half a century ago that in the course of their development allied animals put on at first the characters of the greater groups to which they belong and by degrees assume those which restrict them within the limits of their family genus and species and he proved at the same time that no developmental stage of a higher animal is precisely similar to the adult condition of any lower animal it is quite correct to say that a frog passes through the condition of a fish inasmuch as at one period of its life the tadpole has all the characters of a fish and if it went no further would have to be grouped among the fishes but it is equally true that a tadpole is very different from any known fish in like manner the brain of a human fetus at the fifth month may correctly be said to be not only the brain of an ape but that of an arctopithecine or marmoset like ape for its hemispheres with their great posterior lobster and with no sulci but the sylvian and the calcarine present the characteristics found only in the group of arctopithecine primates but it is equally true as graciolet remarks that in its widely open sylvian fissure it differs from the brain of any actual marmoset no doubt it would be much more similar to the brain of an advanced fetus of a marmoset but we know nothing whatever of the development of the brain in the marmosets in the platyrrhini proper the only observation with which i am acquainted is due to panch who found in the brain of a fetal cebus apella in addition to the sylvian fissure and the deep calcarine fissure only a very shallow anterotemporal fissure seizure parallele of graciolet now this fact taken together with the circumstance that the anterotemporal sulcus is present in such platyrrhini as the samiri which present mere traces of sulci on the anterior half of the exterior of the cerebral hemispheres or none at all undoubtedly so far as it goes affords fair evidence in favor of graciolet's hypothesis that the posterior sulci appear before the anterior in the brains of the platyrrhini but it by no means follows that the rule which may hold good for the platyrrhini extends to the catarrhini we have no information whatever respecting the development of the brain in the cinemorpha and as regards the anthropomorpha nothing but the account of the brain of the gibbon near birth already referred to at the present moment there is not a shadow of evidence to show that the sulci of the chimpanzees or orang's brain do not appear in the same order as man's graciolet opens his preface with the aphorism il est dangereux dans les sciences de conclure draw vite i fear he must have forgotten this sound maxim by the time he had reached the discussion of the differences between men and apes in the body of his work no doubt the excellent author of one of the most remarkable contributions to the just understanding of the mammalian brain which has ever been made would have been the first to admit the insufficiency of his data had he lived to profit by the advance of inquiry the misfortune is that his conclusions have been employed by persons incompetent to appreciate their foundation as arguments in favor of obscurantism for example monsieur l'abbé le comte in his terrible pamphlet le darwinisme et l'origine de l'homme 1873 but it is important to remark that whether graciolet was right or wrong in his hypothesis respecting the relative order of appearance of the temporal and frontal sulci the fact remains 
that before either temporal or frontal sulci appear, the fetal brain of man presents characters which are found only in the lowest group of the primates, leaving out the lemurs, and that this is exactly what we should expect to be the case if man has resulted from the gradual modification of the same form as that from which the other primates have sprung. End of recording. End of section 20. End of The Descent of Man, Part 1. Section 20 recording by Joseph Lawler.